Good morning and welcome to the 20th meeting of 2024 in session 6 of the Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee. We have apologies this morning from Evelyn Tweed, MSP. Our first agenda item is to agree to take item 3, which is consideration of today's evidence in private. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The second item on our agenda is an evidence session on the Delayed Human Rights Bill for Scotland, and we will hear this morning from two witness panels. I refer members to papers one and two, and I welcome to the meeting our first panel of witnesses. Neil Cowan, Scotland Programme Director, Amnesty International UK. Emma Hutton, Chief Executive Officer, Just Right Scotland. Lucy Miller, Policy and Communications Lead, Human Rights Consortium Scotland. Professor Angela O'Hagan, Chair, Scottish Human Rights Commission, and John Wilkes, Head of Scotland Equality and Human Rights Commission Scotland. You're all very welcome this morning and thank you for attending. Because our time is at a bit of a premium this morning, we are just going to head straight into questions. And I will start and ask you, um, what has been your involvement in the development of the Human Rights Bill? And can I start with Neil, please? Um, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to, to take part in the session today. Um, in terms of Amnesty International's involvement, so we've been extremely supportive of the proposals for, for many years and you know, with uh, organisations and individuals across Scotland be campaigning for uh, foreign cooperation. Um, we, with Human Rights Consortium Scotland, co-convened the Civil Society Working Group on Incorporation, which brings together uh, civil society organisations and academics from, uh, from across Scotland to, um, to discuss the proposals, to work on the proposals, to campaign on the proposals. And that's been running since 2019. Um, in terms of our sort of formal involvement with, I suppose, the architecture around the bill, um, so we fairly recently became members of the Human Rights Bill Advisory Board. Um, regrettably, the board hasn't actually met since we became members in April um, due to the, the various delays. Um, and we're also, we're also members of the, the wider implementation group um, as well. So, as I say, we've been um, involved in campaigning for the proposals from a very early stage um, and have been supportive of them um, from, the, from the very outset. Thank you so much. We'll move on to Emma, please. Thank you, and uh, thank you for, for having us here today. Um, so Just Right Scotland, for those who don't know, is a human rights organisation. We use the law to defend and extend people's rights. We work with hundreds of people every year who experience violation of their, violations of their rights and have partnerships with around 50 different organisations across Scotland. So we've been um, very keen and willing uh, to share our experience and our expertise with the um, Scottish Government and others through the development process for this bill so far. Um, we've tried to bring our perspective as frontline legal practitioners uh, to try and make sure that uh, the bill that emerges from this process is practicable and useful um, and as strong as possible in terms of providing uh, real, uh, real teeth uh, when it comes to enforcing people's rights. Um, in, in practical terms, we have been uh, active members of the Human Rights Bill Advisory Board since it was established in September 2021. I myself am the lead uh, representative from Just Right Scotland in that, that board, um, but where I've not been available, other colleagues have, have stepped in for me. Um, we've also had several bilateral meetings with the Cabinet Secretary and senior officials from the Human Rights Directorate over the past 36 months to explore specific issues. Um, we are host to a panel of people with lived experience of the migration system called Just Citizens, and we've supported and facilitated their engagement with this process as well. We're also active members of the Scottish Association of Law Centres, and again, have been proactive in facilitating dialogue between the Bill team and, and that network. Uh, and, and like many other organisations, we've taken part in various um, roundtable discussions, meetings, working groups to look at and explore and provide our perspective on numerous aspects of the, the bill um, and including the formal consultation process that, that took place last summer. We produced, a, I think, a 53-page uh, response to that formal consultation. Thank you, Emma. Now move on to Lucy, please. Thank you. Um, so I'm from the Human Rights Consortium Scotland and our job is to promote and defend human rights across Scotland and we have over 220 members of civil society that help us do that. So the consortium has played a hugely proactive role, if not the leading role, collaborating with various stakeholders to shape the Human Rights Bill in Scotland. We strongly support the incorporation of all international human rights treaties into Scots law, uh, along with the right to a healthy environment. This effort 
uh, aligns with the aim of the UNCRC incorporation bill, uh, working towards a framework that recognises and enforces economic, social, cultural um, and environmental and group rights alongside existing protections under the Human Rights Act and Scotland Act 1998. Throughout the development process, we engaged in comprehensive consultations, contributing valuable insights alongside civil society organisations, legal experts and marginalised groups. We facilitated the lived experience boards for the Scottish Government, which provided crucial advice on conducting a human rights based consultation. And while the government implemented some of these recommendations, including the availability of different formats for feedback, there remains a need for broader engagement strategies to ensure the voices of marginalised communities are effectively included within this bill. It's also important to note that we developed a consultation toolkit last summer. Um, we engaged with over 100 organisations which worked with that toolkit to answer the 44 question long consultation. So we have done a mass amount of work on this. Um, our stakeholders as well have also voiced significant concerns regarding the bill, particularly around access to justice, and we have raised this rep repeatedly with the Scottish Government. Thank you, Lucy. Um, Angela, please. Good morning, convener, and thank you for the opportunity to be here um, in my first um, committee appearance as the chair of um, Scotland's National Human Rights Institution. And the Scottish Human Rights Commission has a long-standing involvement in, in this bill, in the principles of the bill, the, the championing and advocacy for incorporation of rights um, throughout the historical trajectory um, over the last 17 years of, of calls for incorporation. Um, my predecessors in this role and others have been heavily involved um, with successive um, proposals and governments and other structures around incorporation. Um, the technical expertise of the expert legal and policy staff of the Commission has been again heavily committed to engaging in technical advice on the bill responding to consultations on the bill <coughs> excuse me, and in the wider discussions around um, what are the institutional and structural um, mechanisms and, and structures necessary to, to support effective landing of a bill in Scotland. Um, we have been consistently supportive of incorporation because it's about bringing rights into law and bringing effective remedy for the ongoing breaches of rights, um, as colleagues have described, um, and ultimately making those rights real in people's everyday lives. And that's the role of the Commission in terms of promoting awareness um, and engagement with rights and the enjoyment of rights. And I also want to, to acknowledge um, the immense contribution that colleagues in civil society have made to developing expertise across their own membership, the, the engagement in the bill process um, and the building of, of aspirations um, and requirements for incorporation. Thank you. Uh, John, please. Thank you, convener, and thank you for inviting us to uh, speak to you today. Um, the Equality and Human Rights Commission has two functions. We are the regulator of the UK Equality Act across Scotland, England and Wales. And we're also, like the Scottish Human Rights Commission, are an accredited national human rights institution. Our human rights mandate, as defined in the Equality Act 2006 um, in Scotland, um, relates to reserve matters unless we have the consent of the Scottish Human Rights Commission. So our approach to this process of incorporation of treaty rights has focused on the aspects of where the proposals would interface with existing UK equality legislation. And that's been our focus. We've been involved in the process since the National Human Rights Task Force, of which we sat on. We very much welcome the report and recommendations about incorporation of treaties, which is in line with our view that anything that improves the realisation of rights is a positive thing. Since that um, report, we have been involved in all of the working groups of the Scottish Government, the Bill Executive Board, Advisory Board and Implementation Working Group. Uh, we have um, met with government officials regularly, again with our focus and remit on trying to advise about how the proposals would engage with existing equality legislation mm -hmm. going forward. Thank you. Thank you all very much. We'll now move on to questions from Maggie Chapman, please. Thanks very much, convener. Good morning to the panel. Thank you for being here this morning and for everything that you've outlined that you've done um, in, in the space so far. Um, I'm interested in 
in just teasing out some of why everybody thinks this bill was such such an important piece of legislation. And I suppose the, the sort of simple question would, what difference would such a bill make? But I, I, I wonder if in your answers you could maybe think about where there are deficiencies in the current human rights landscape in Scotland, where there are, whether those are deficiencies of law, deficiencies of service provision, of, of, of implementation of uh, policies or strategies. But because I think one of, the, one of the things that we hear, well, that we heard up until the point that the, the, there was not going to be this bill, um, this session, was so much hope being pinned on this piece of legislation. So, so I suppose, what difference um, do you think this bill could have, should have made for, for, for Scotland because of existing deficiencies gaps in, in, in the landscape? Um, I will ask all of you, I don't know who wants to go first. Emma, you... you uh, to go first. Go for it. Yeah, um, so I think... Um, I think it's important to recognise that this bill um, would not and will not be a panacea to all of the problems and all of the gaps that exist when it comes to making everybody's human rights a reality in Scotland. And I don't think, certainly uh, Just Right Scotland would never have described it in, in those terms. Um, that said, um, it's certainly, from our point of view, a really important part of the picture, an important part of the range of solutions that need to be, and the range of measures that need to be taken to, to make people's rights uh, a meaningful reality. Mm. Um, we uh, at Just Rights Scotland currently use uh, human rights legislation through the Human Rights Act, um, in particular, to um, seek accountability when uh, and seek remedy when. Um, uh, things go wrong uh, with people's rights. Now, that's not easy to do. Um, I'm sure this committee is aware of the range of barriers to access to justice that exist for people. So it's not that um, just because rights are protected in law that they're necessarily easy to, to then uh, claim and enforce. But nonetheless, um, it's important that that legal backstop of protection is there um, and can be uh, can be used uh, where there is no other, other measure available. Um, and so the reason that this bill is important is it provides that legal protection or it would provide that legal protection for a much wider range of internationally recognised human rights. So uh, economic, social, cultural rights, as well as um, specific rights for people who face particular barriers to, to experiencing their rights, such as disabled people, people experiencing racism. Um, so for us, it would be a really important um, way for accountability, um, for people's rights to be strengthened um, and uh, when we're in a situation in Scotland where we have hundreds of thousands of people relying on food banks in order to feed themselves and their families, where we have a national housing emergency, where racism is still uh, an endemic um, and stubborn problem, these are real issues that affect millions of people across Scotland and anything and everything that we can do to strengthen uh, accountability and give people some sort of redress and remedy where, where those violations take place is crucial. Th thanks, Emma. Lucy, do you want to come in? Yeah, of course. Um, so the delay in introducing the Human Rights Bill for Scotland is concerning as it directly affects both immediate and long-term outcomes in Scotland. So as Emma was saying, currently many people in Scotland lack the necessary power and agency over their own lives. The absence of a comprehensive economic, social and cultural rights framework means that vital decisions affecting people's livelihoods, such as those surrounding homelessness, health and um, access to essential services, remain disconnected from the voices of those directly impacted by that. This delay perpetuates existing inequalities as well, um, as marginalised groups continue to struggle without the legal tools to demand their rights and hold decision makers accountable. As highlighted in various reports, and I'm sure Angela will come to this, um, from the Scottish Human Rights Commission, the lack of a robust rights protection leaves many vulnerable to ongoing violations of their fundamental rights. In the long term, the absence of this framework risks depoliticising critical budgetary and policy making processes. So by prioritising human rights in this constitutional way, we create a system where it doesn't matter what parties in government because human rights are put first. It doesn't matter if we fall short of money for the budget because things like homelessness and health have to be put first. That is where the government's priority will be. And we most importantly, with an ESCAR framework, we cannot regress on human rights. So things like the winter fuel payment, that would, um, that would be against a human rights law um, in, in cutting that, as we saw in the last few weeks. I want to talk a wee bit as well about the 
what this would mean for human rights budgeting across the government. Applying this to Scotland's current challenges, particularly around resource prioritisation, so we're constantly told we don't have the resources for that, um, it would mean that human rights budgeting would depoliticise that decision making, as I said. Instead of resources being driven by those political motives, they are directed towards the areas that need them the most, such as homelessness and hunger. Um, by placing people and their rights at the centre, it ensures that financial decisions are not about gaining votes and are about creating meaningful and long-term change. The bill will compel public authorities to embed human rights into their budgeting <coughs> planning as well and service delivery through a human rights-based approach. Essentially, it means our public services in Scotland will have to make the right decision and um, will do that through a human rights-based approach, so it's incredibly important. Th thanks. thanks, Lucy. Can I, can I just pick up on, on one thing you said there? Your last statement, actually, public bodies would have to prioritise human rights. That would... That there would be the, the, the legal, uh, well, the risk of, of legal action if they didn't. Do you think that the current landscape, I mean, Emma, you might want to come back on this as well. When you talk about access to justice, do you think the current landscape doesn't allow individuals to, to seek remedy? It has to be through organisations or through some kind of other, other mechanism. I will let Emma come in on this after, after I say a wee bit. Uh, no, it doesn't. It, it is an absolute labyrinth for people to access justice within this country. Um, there are individual routes to do it, but they're incredibly complex and often the legal routes are full of jargon, which are hard for, um, f for lawyers to understand themselves mm -hmm. as well. So, no, I don't think the system is set up for people to access justice effectively. As well as that, even if they are going through groups to access justice, as you say, that can sometimes be incredibly difficult as well, as there's no resource for it. Um, that framework is not in place to ensure that resources are directed to it as well. And um, I'm sure you'll hear the Human Rights Consortium talking about this a lot more over the next few years. But um, it just means that provisions that would help increase access to justice in this country, such as reform of civil legal aid, are, are not appropriately looked at and they're not considered as they should be. Okay. This bill would, would make that so. OK, Th thanks, Lucy. Emma, briefly, and then I'll come to Neil. Um, yeah, just to, I suppose, expand a little bit on, on what Lucy said. Um, the reality is that um, if, as an individual, you're in a situation where your uh, rights have been violated, the number of uh, hurdles and barriers that you have to overcome in order to, to get redress and remedy for that are, are almost unfathomable. Um, first of all, you have to know that you have those rights in the first place, and we have a, a huge gap around that. Secondly, you have to know where to go to get advice and support mm -hmm. when uh, your rights have been breached. Uh, and there is a, a real chronic um, uh, shortage of uh, you know, consistent um, sources of specialist, free, confidential, um, trauma-informed, person-centred advice uh, services across Scotland. We, there are a number of us doing our best to fill those gaps, but it's, it's certainly not a, um, a nationally resourced um, and kind of sustainable and available um, service that anybody can, can access. And even if you find yourself knowing that you've had your rights breached, finding somebody who can give you some advice. Um, you then have to try and navigate, uh, if you want to take legal action, you then have to try and navigate the civil legal aid system, which is a whole other labyrinth in itself mm -hmm. uh, with very <coughs> complex eligibility rules. Um, and that's before we even get into things like um, time bar on claims and so on and so forth. So there are huge hurdles uh, that individuals have to, to navigate. Um, and... I think it's also really important to remember that anybody who is in that situation is also, uh, by definition, uh, experiencing a, a significant degree of trauma and um, disadvantage, which makes even taking the first step through that process very, very challenging. So systemic change is, is really important. OK. Thanks, Emma. Neil, if I can um, come to you. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the value of the bill, I think Lucy and Emma have articulated it um, perfectly, so I'll just be really reflecting on what they say. I think, as Emma said, you know, the Human Rights Bill is not a silver bullet, um, but it could go a long way to addressing some of the you know, the, the major issues that we face in Scotland. You know, again, important to put in context, we have over a million people in Scotland living in the grip of poverty, we have a declared national housing emergency, we have record levels of homelessness, we have unacceptably high levels of food insecurity, and that's all the responsibility of all levels of government. 
Um, and again, the bill is not a, a silver bullet to addressing those issues, mm -hmm. but it could go a long way to addressing lots of them. Um, in terms of the specific um, value of the bill, you know, it would, by placing clear duties on public authorities, really embed rights into decision making and to law making as well in a way that we don't currently have, and that could, you know, have a, a really transformative impact um, on decision making and outcomes, and ultimately on people's lives. And that's what the legislation. That's why it's so important. That's why it's so critical. Um, and it would have the effect of making the rights we all have um, a reality in a way that doesn't currently exist. And I think that's why the decision around the bill um, is so disappointing and, and concerning. Okay. Can I, from, from Amnesty's point of view, if, if, if I can keep going, um, th th there's, there's a question for... for we, we, around this table in this committee, we, we've talked about um, the different groups of people who, who may have easier or better access to, to rights than others. And um, I'm just wondering, in, in the work that Amnesty does, are there, I'm thinking, I, I suppose, particularly of, of migrants or of immigrants, people who are here for a whole range of reasons, uh, you know, choice or, or otherwise, are there particular challenges that legislation like this could have, could, could have supported? Because I don't, we, we don't, we talk about human rights as as a universal thing, but we don't apply them universally. And, and I, I just wonder if you could pick that up a, a little bit more. Yeah, well, I, mean, I think, um, I guess Emma might be able to touch a bit on that in terms of issues around people, um, in terms of migrants, and et cetera. But um, I think what the bill would do is help to build a human rights culture, and that would be a culture in which people, everyone, would be much better able to, to name and claim their rights, and individuals and groups would be better able to access uh, justice when their rights when their rights are not respected when their rights are violated and so um, so yes that would help to address those particular issues facing facing particular groups absolutely okay, okay thanks John if I can come to to you next just the difference that such a bill could could should make to Scotland thank you um, well like others have said no one piece of legislation is going to be a panacea but it's about the signals it sends it would be about ensuring that public authorities are more focused on their obligations around human rights, which the Human Rights Act gives, but this would provide a, another set of levers. I suppose our experience from the equality legislation perspective is that it's important to have the legislation in place, that important that people have access to seek redress against discrimination, but it's a slow process. 50 years of the Equal Pay Act, 40 years of sex discrimination, race discrimination legislation, 30 years of disability discrimination <laughs> suggests that you know these are slow processes but having these frameworks of legislation and levers are important because it provides <coughs> the ability to redress and it would send a signal I think about it, about the importance of the human rights culture in Scotland and um, I think the other thing is that as others have said I think another potential outcome is that citizens might be on a journey to better understand that the rights they have and then feel more empowered to sort of seek seek redress against those but obviously there are plenty of other things that need to be put in place alongside the bill in terms of access to justice and all of those other things adequate powers for, for organizations who would seek then to regulate um, those those those, leg those that legislation Okay, thanks. Do you want to say anything more about the, the powers there, or shall I move, move <laughs> seamlessly on to Angela? Well, um, I mean, um, as I say, our, our remit and focus in this in this area is very much around the interface of the equality. It's our colleagues in the Scottish yeah. Human Rights Commission who have the human rights mandate. I, I suppose what we have been trying to do with government is share our experience as a as a regulator mm. of equality legislation and what powers and duties and responsibilities we have and how they might be a model uh, in terms of taking forward a, a human rights bill. Okay, okay th thanks, John. That, that's helpful. Angela, over to you. Given, given where SHRC has been uh, over the last uh, uh, several years, not only in this process, but also in, in the work for the, the work you've undertaken to to focus on areas of um, uh, failure, I suppose, uh, is what we're talking about. How, how important, what difference was this bill going to make? Why, why, why are there so many, why were there so many hopes pinned on this, do you think? Um, why were there so many hopes? I think there's a number of, of threads in, in there. One is the enduring and entrenched 
um, violations of rights and the failures of rights realisations experienced by people in Scotland in their everyday lives, whether, as colleagues have referred to, um, poverty, hunger, um, being cold, not being housed, not having shelter. Um, these are all the everyday realities for so many people in in this country um, that that do point to that failure of of as you said in your introduction to the question law services the design and implementation of services and service provision and and policy thinking about human rights from the very beginning thinking about how do we structure um, and resource our public services and the implementation of people's rights in such a way that human rights um, across all groups. So through that intersectional lens, the realisation of rights is the starting point for policy making and revenue raising and resource allocation. Um, and that's been a significant failure, I think, of the approach of mainstreaming that has not delivered that way of thinking and doing, because that's what's taking a human rights based approach is. It's thinking about rights realisation from the start, mm. understanding the data that is available and where there are data gaps and applying that in the, in the, the evidence process. And in terms of our powers, we have no very limited powers of inquiry and investigation. What we have been doing is through our Spotlight series is evidencing the very significant gaps in terms of deficiencies of rights realisation in places of detention, in access to economic and social rights, particularly in relation to health provision, particularly in rural areas. Through our um, Spotlights, again, looking at the deprivation of rights in long-term residential care, despite repeated commitments from government, despite resources being allocated and despite legislative provision. Our treaty monitoring work consistently highlights, in relation to people of colour and black and minority ethnic people, the racialised discrimination and rights violations that they experience on a daily basis, alongside disabled people whose rights are consistently not being met. The bill would not, in its current form, perhaps have delivered on all of those rights, but what it would have done would, would, would have been providing an opportunity to ensure that better um, incorporation of, of the existing conventions. Um, I'm very pleased to, to hear colleagues talk so much about human rights analysis in the budgetary process. The raising and allocation of, of <coughs> revenue is essential. As is, but in order to do that effectively, public authorities as duty bearers need to better understand and be less resistant to their obligations that already exist in law and to take a human rights based approach that isn't seen as an encumbrance but rather as an enabling approach to better service design delivery um, and subsequently the realization of rights but there hasn't been a priority either you know, discursively or in terms of, of building that, that awareness that means the human rights culture we have at the moment is one of seeing rights as, as, as a, something other, something alien, rather than it is the means to, to realising the, the political narrative that exists across parties on dignity, autonomy. We have it in some of our legislation, but we don't have it in the implementation. And the limited powers of the National Human Rights um, institution um, do undermine um, one key aspect of all of this, which also relates to the Parliament, and that is accountability. And the absence of the bill means an absence of accountability. Now, we don't just rely on the incorporation bill to provide accountability. That is the role of the NHRI, but it's also the role of this committee and this Parliament to act as a guarantor of rights um, and of human rights in Scotland. And that's where the, the human rights culture and amplifying the possibility of and the potential of legal reinforcement, legal underpinning to what should be the everyday rights of, of people in Scotland um, would have been a, a hugely significant um, motor and part of that infrastructure. Thanks, Angela. I, I could go on, but I, I probably shouldn't. I, I just want to, to just highlight your, your last point there about all of us in this place as guarantors of everybody's human rights. I don't think all 129 of us think of ourselves in that way, and, and maybe we need to. Thanks, Kay. Thank you. Um, we'll now move on to questions from Paul O'Kane, please. Uh, thank you very much, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, when the government um, announced that they weren't proceeding uh, as expected with uh, the bill, 
a number of reasons were given. Um, and I would be keen to understand the panel's view uh, on those reasons. Um, did they find the, the reasons convincing? Or do they think that there are other things? And you've, you've started to touch on these, I appreciate, in your first answers. You know, but are, are there other reasons, for example, budgetary pressures on the Scottish Government? Um, or, or are there things that are at play that are, you think might be uh, part of the reason this bill uh, is not proceeding? Um, I'll maybe start with uh, Neil Cowan. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think the first thing to say is that this is a decision, as you probably picked up, that we strongly and firmly disagree with and are, are actually deeply concerned by. Um, and I think it's important to be clear that the decision to delay the bill um, was a choice. It wasn't something the Scottish Government had been necessarily completely forced into. There were other options available. Um, in terms of the rationale, I think there's undoubtedly um, complexities and challenges. That's that's completely apparent. Um, but we don't believe these to be insurmountable, um, and we don't believe that they've acquired the decision to delay the bill um, as it has been. Um, we think that there were in our ways um, of navigating those complexities, I'm sure you'll come to some of those in the second panel today, um, that would have allowed the bill to be introduced um, this year and certainly this parliamentary session. Um, and that the fact that the decision has been made um, suggests to us that actually it's just not been deemed a sufficient priority. Um, and that's a perfectly legitimate decision for a government to take. But I think we need to be honest that that's what has happened here. Um, I think we're in a situation where we're currently being told that um, the, the proposals remain a priority and that the commitment to the proposals are, are sort of unwavering. But it's kind of hard to square that with the decision that's been made and it's hard to square that with where we are. Um, and it's, it's difficult to escape the conclusion that if that was indeed the case, then some of those complexities and challenges could have been navigated and overcome. Um, and again, I come back to the context that we're in. Over a million people living in poverty, declared national housing emergency, record levels of homelessness. The urgency with which this bill was needed is significant. Um, and I think as a result of the decision, um, you know, faith in that commitment to human rights has been undermined. Um, and actually, more broadly, I think this decision undermines some of the Scottish Government's stated priorities of tackling child poverty, of tackling climate emergency, of improving public services. Um, and so for all those reasons, um, I think the decision is a deeply concerning one. And uh, I suppose to specifically answer your question, in terms of the challenges and complexities, we accept them, we see them, we understand them, but they're also not new. Um, and we think they were navigable. Um, so that's why the decision is so, I think, deeply disappointing. Yeah, Martin would want to... Yeah, um, I mean, I echo a lot of what Neil's said there, and maybe just to sort of uh, add a little bit of uh, further kind of contextual colour to that. I think it's important to remember that we're now approaching, I think, nine years since the uh, then First Minister first kind of uh, committed the, the Scottish Government at that point to embarking on the process of uh, exploring options for incorporating um, more international human rights. Um, that was at a conference at Dynamic Earth in December 2015. Since then, we've had um, a First Minister's advisory group exploring these issues. We've followed by a national task force on human rights leadership, which led to the um, recommendations for the bill. We've had the, the bill development process that we've already described. Um, and so we're not just talking about engagement and grappling with these issues over the last few years. We're, we're talking about um, a process that's been on for some quite considerable time. Um, and as Neil says, the issues, uh, the, the stated reasons that have been given by um, the Cabinet Secretary for the decision to um, not introduce the bill um, before the next uh, Scottish Parliament elections are, are reasons that are not new. There's nothing in there that has not been around for a couple of years now. Um, and I think you know, my organisation and others have engaged in good faith in, in a process of consultation and engagement on these proposals, knowing that these complexities exist, working hard actually to engage with those complexities, to provide our perspective on those complexities, to provide suggestions for navigating those complexities. Um, and so it's, it's really challenging for us to now be told that uh, having done that, having put so much time and effort and energy into that process, um, that now the bill is not going to go forward when nothing actually material has changed since uh, this time last year or even two years ago. So to answer your question, are we convinced by the, the reasons that have been given for the delay? No, we're not. Um, I, I don't think I can really speculate on what the, the other reasons may be, um, but certainly the reasons that have been given don't make sense to us. 
I appreciate you don't want to speculate, <laughs> um, but but I mean that point about budgetary pressures. Do you think that's something that um, played a role, perhaps, to the overarching programme for government? Um, if not this decision, I mean we we're all. It would be impossible to ignore the uh, repeated messaging around budgetary pressures. We all understand the the fiscal constraints that. Um, we're operating under as as third sector organisations. We experience those, um, you know, as much as, if not more, than than others. Um, but I think um, whether that has been part of the the government's reasoning or not, it's important to remember that actually it's it's when human rights are even more important at times of pressure on resources because that's when difficult decisions do need to be made about priorities. Priorities, And as others have talked about, that's where taking a human rights-based approach to making decisions is, is really important. So if there has been a budgetary uh, concern underpinning the decision here, I think that's a really misplaced concern and this is a missed opportunity to actually look at embedding a, a human rights-based approach into future financial and budgetary decision-making. Just on those questions, I wonder if there's anything Lucy wants to add, because I'm going to just pivot slightly when I come to uh, Professor Hagen, if that's possible. Uh, yes, please. Um, so, like Amnesty and Just Right Scotland, we are deeply disappointed by this decision. And the Scottish Government's reasoning for delaying it centres around legal constraints on the devolution settlement, <coughs> particularly following the 2021 UK Supreme Court ruling on the UNCRC. Um, this ruling admittedly significantly curtailed the Scottish Parliament's ability to legislate on devolved matters in a way that might impact reserved powers, but the government has cited a need to ensure that the Human Rights Bill avoids similar legal challenges and lines with the limits of devolution uh, uh, under the Scotland Act um, we see as, as not credible at this point. Um, we see a new UK government as a new opportunity to put this forward and um, the Cabinet Secretary has described the relationship as being at the foothills. But with this new government, it just doesn't make sense to us as an organisation why this wouldn't have been introduced, um, given that they are more to the left on human rights based policies. Um, our concern, like John, is that this delay sends the message that human rights are being deprioritised. And we actually saw that with less human rights language throughout the programme for government itself. Um, Again, those legal challenges, though real, should not prevent the government from taking a strong stand on advancing human rights elsewhere. We believe that the Scottish Government should have pursued a bolder approach, addressing these constraints through careful drafting. Again, they've had years to do this, while still moving forward with urgency. I want to also talk about the fact that the government cited the reason of needing more engagement with stakeholders before progressing with this. There has been swathes of engagement, almost too much engagement. And while we appreciate the effort made to engage our stakeholders throughout the process, there is a persistent concern that these consultations have had limited influence on the outcomes, with many feeling that their voices have not been sufficiently heard or acted upon. It raises a real risk of the process becoming tokenistic, where engagement is more symbolic than impactful. And despite this uh, re re repetition of consultation, communities are not seeing real change on the ground. And that is the most important thing here, is that there is a real implementation gap between the human rights levers we have across the UK and um, what people are facing in Scotland. And as we said to, in response to Maggie's question, this human rights bill would have made a difference to that. I wonder if I can just briefly expand on some of that. Do you think in terms of the interaction with the UK government, the Scottish government has at times said that the, the relationship with the previous government was too difficult in this space, and now seem to be suggesting that the relationship with the new government has the opportunity to be more successful, and I'm not sure those two things can be <laughs> can be entirely true. So, so you know, is your sense that actually you know, there is a need just for, for the government to move forward and, and stay its aim and try and work with that incoming government regardless in order to move the bill forward? To answer your first question, I don't think it's any secret to anyone that um, when we had a Conservative government at Westminster, it was difficult for the Scottish government to work with them. And that's not me placing blame on the Scottish government for that. It was it's, it's all over the media. You just have to look back through the last few decades of headlines to see that difficult relationship. Um, to answer the second question, yes, this is an opportunity to dive right into it. And I think instead of delaying it, there sh the proposals should have been put forward. OK, thank you. Um, in coming to Professor Higgin, you had commented in a previous answer about um, the government statement about trying to do more in protecting disabled people, women, 
uh, and uh, people who experience racism. Uh, and obviously, that uh, the government have stated that they need to do more work, or they feel that there needs to be more work in that space. Um, but, but I think you had said you felt that um, you know, the, yes, of course, there's more work to be done in those treaties. But of course, we have made progress as well. So I wonder if you might be able to capture some of that in terms of, you know, that as an excuse for delay, and actually what what can be done in in, in that space. I don't. Um, I suppose I won't stray into the equalities dimensions, which are, are the um, domain of the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Um, but again, I mean, it's part of the more generalised argument that there were legal complexities that had not been worked through in the draft bill, which none of us are actually able to comment upon because we haven't seen a draft bill, just as we haven't seen a, a, a financial memorandum. So we can't really comment on whether budgetary costs or, or um, envisaged costs around implementation have been a, a motive. We've also um, highlighted across the course of the conversation this morning the significant resources that have already gone in to getting a draft bill to, 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 to where it, it didn't get to. Um, and so in terms of resourcing, um, which is, is, I appreciate it's not the question you asked, but it's about taking that perspective, um, which I elaborated on in, in my last answer. So there are complexities, legal complexities, and complexities around supporting implementation, but complexity is not a reason not to do the right thing. And the complexities were well known to the Scottish Government prior to the 4th of September when the decision was announced on the programme for government and had not previously, in, in, in contrast really to the expectations across um, the sector um, in relation to, to what was happening with, with the bill. What else can be done in this space? Well, again, we've given a long list of where rights are not realised in the everyday lives of people, where lives are not, where rights are not being considered in the formulation of, of policy making. Colleagues elsewhere in this building today are giving evidence on the national outcomes. Again, a driver potentially for a human rights based approach. The National Care Service um, bill coming through and committees taking evidence on the National Care Service, where again, there is opportunity to to act much more decisively and clearly around incorporation of the Convention on the Rights of Disabled People within the National Care Service as it is within the, the Social Security legislation. So there is plenty of existing legislation that must be read and delivered through a human rights lens. And so colleagues have referenced housing crisis, um, food crisis, um, and we've all talked about, about resourcing. What we saw in the spending decisions the day before the programme for government belied any notion. I've been in front of this committee, I don't know how many times, with different hats on in the past, talking about equality and human rights based budgeting. The decisions that were made to remove asylum seeker um, tra access to, to transport, to remove free school meals, echo what Neil's saying in terms of where's the coherence with the political priorities and the resourcing decisions made. There's nobody who's going to deny that, that we're, you know, the tight fiscal space is, is real. But as the Scottish Fiscal Commission have also been highlighting over a number of years now, we have to change how we think about policy making and how we think about raising and allocating resources if we are to address the widening gaps of the failure of rights realisation and widening inequalities. So there is a lot to be done in this space, to use your phrase, um, by committees and in the process of scrutinising policy and legislation that comes forward from any government. I'm not making political points here, I'm talking about the efficacy and approach to policy making. Um, and that is a cross-party responsibility and it's a responsibility of the, the whole parliament in amplifying um, what should be the approach of, of government in terms of implementing existing human rights um, requirements, but taking a human rights-based approach to policy and lawmaking. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I wonder if, just if John wants to add anything um, in terms of those two questions. Um, <clears throat> I think what we would say is that we're also disappointed that the government has decided not to proceed with the bill at this stage, given the amount of work, effort that's gone in over many years. We did note that one of the aspects given was the challenges around the equal opportunities aspect of the bill, and 
obviously is that is potentially in our space. We did recognise that, um, and how the bill. Obviously, we haven't seen a draft bill yet, so we can comment on what the final proposals were going to be. But we recognise that there was an issue, an area there, as we said before, about how the bill would engage with existing equalities legislation, noting the reservations in the Scotland Act. Um, there are potentially ways forward, but it is complicated. Um, but that was the situation two or three years ago. I think we, we raised those very issues in the National Task Force report that, that uh, was published in 2021. We hope that the delay is not going to be too protracted so that the momentum isn't, isn't lost and we remain uh, willing and keen to help advise on those particular aspects of any bill that comes forward. Thank you, Convener. <laughs> thank you. We'll now move on to questions from Marie McNair, please. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning, panel. Um, the driving principle behind the incorporation of uh, economic, social and cultural rights was to ensure non-regression uh, from uh, guaranteed from the mem membership of the European Union. What impact uh, will the non-introduction of the bill have on these aims? Um, and I'll go to Neil first. Um, can I come back on that one? Sure. Okay. Anyone else want to start? Could you just just repeat the question and I'll have a... Just saying the, the sort of driving principle um, behind the incorporation of the ESC uh, rights was to ensure non-regression of uh, rights currently guaranteed by the membership of the European Union. What impact will the non-introduction of the bill have on these aims? I mean, I can come in if that's, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think um, from our perspective, the, the driving principle of uh, the driving principle behind the introduction of the bill was about um, advancing and uh, strengthening protection for a wider range of rights um, recognised uh, in the whole international human rights framework. So not just those that are set out in the European Conven Convention of Human Rights or. Um, in the, the context of the European Union. So um, I, I think that that would be our sort of starting point for, for looking at this. Um, and um, I think that uh, the, the real um, impact now of this bill not going forward in the timescale that we were expecting is that we won't see the progress that we were hoping to see um, and we won't have uh, the same uh, steps towards greater accountability to ensure that very non-regression that, that you're talking about. So it's a kind of absence of something uh, that we were hoping would help to strengthen uh, everybody's ability to, to ensure that that principle is protected. Thank you. Do you want to come in now, Neil? I can come in if that is out of the yeah, so again, like Emma, that's not the main reason that we saw the driver of this human rights bill. So I wanted to talk a bit to the reasoning of the scope of devolution being a reason for a delay here as well. Um, and just say that if it is going to have an impact on those rights that you talk about, the government needs to be far more transparent about its conversations with Westminster on limitations imposed by a devolution settlement, um, i.e. not being protected by European mechanisms, as I think you're uh, implying. The Supreme Court judgment on the UNCRC incorporation should not be treated as an excuse, as I said, but as a challenge to be overcome through collaborative dialogue. What's really important to note here is that we have successfully, as a parliament, incorporated the UNCRC already. So we have a basis of which incorporation can work from in this country. Um, of course, there were challenges with that, but challenge shouldn't stop government taking risks when human rights are the priority. Um, the government must openly share where these barriers exist within devolution. We've been told that there might be um, there might be barriers, and I said, as the Cabinet Secretary told us, we're at the foothills of this relationship. But if we could have some clarification on how it plans to negotiate these conversations with the UK government, that would be really helpful. And also using our expertise and civil society as a bridge between intergovernmental relationships will be really important going forward in order to get this right. Thank you. Okay. You're all right, yeah. Thanks. Just to, to, I mean, there's, and colleagues have, have very effectively covered some of the legal points and, and policy issues. Um, but there's also, I mean, the principle of non-regression 
should absolutely apply across all, all lawmaking and policy um, development and resource allocation service design. Things should not be made worse by, by future interventions. That's the whole point. And, or by the absence of intervention, the failure to act, um, which is, has been in this case. Um, and when we go through the kind of litany that we have of, of failures of rights realisation, um, <clears throat> it's clear that across... Um, policy making and, and legislation, there is a need both within this parliament and within government and within duty bearers to be considering these principles. And one of the things that, that did require some further development and stewardship, it had a bill been introduced, was considering minimum core obligations. What is the very basic, basic, you know, the most basic of basics that people should be uh, enjoying in terms of, of rights. And that needed, I mean, it's, in some ways it's, it's quite bizarre to think about, we needed to actually bottom that out. What are the very basics that people should have? Well, housing, shelter, food, warmth. Um, we need to bottom out those very basics, both in law and in terms of how services are provided. So that's absolutely linking the question back to, to Mr O'Kane's question about what can happen in this. <clears throat> if, we, if we have to regard this, this um, delay in the bill, as it's been promised as a delay, if we take that hiatus as an opportunity, then there is an opportunity to, to start to shift the, the narrative, shift the culture and shift the practice with duty bearers, the, the public authorities that need to be thinking about what are the minimum, what is the very minimum and how we work up from that. And that, I think, is a reasonable aspiration for Parliament as well. What's the very basic that we need to work up from? Because at the moment we're failing on some of those basics and what the bill would have done with careful stewardship is perhaps reinforce what we in Scotland understand to mean those minimum core obligations. Thank you. I much appreciate your comments there. Um, the committee would also be grateful um, for your comments on how the non-introduction of the bill has been communicated to stakeholders um, and those who have been kind of developing the bill um, over the years. And obviously, you know, you've commented that on already, but just to give you the opportunity to expand where you, where you want to come in. Um, yeah, I'm happy to, to come in on that. I think. Um, and I think if we're speaking totally frankly, I think the decision took us all by surprise. I don't think any of us expected the bill to be delayed until, to the extent that it has been. So I think that has caused, um, I think if we're speaking totally frankly, some anger. Um, you know, trust has been, if not broken, and certainly frayed. And that's trust not just between, I think, government and civil society, but also between civil society and communities. I mean, many organisations involved in the development of the bill, um, you know, expended a huge amount of, of time and resource and energy engaging with communities, bringing people in, supporting them to kind of overcome suspicions around, you know, engaging in this type of process. And ultimately what's happened is, you know, a lot of people I think feel let down and that I think has resulted in a, in a lack of trust. So in terms of how it's communicated, how it was communicated, I think um, it was an unexpected decision. Um, there wasn't necessarily um, much warning to it. Um, and I think the concerning thing as well is that thus far at the moment there's not necessarily a, a firm offer in place. We're not necessarily clear on what the Scottish Government's plans are moving forward beyond a kind of broad commitment to continuing to develop the proposals. So I think what we would really like to see from the Scottish Government um, with urgency really is a clear sense of where they're at, where they're going. Um, you know, if we can see a draft bill, then fantastic. Let's let's have that in the open. Let's see where we're working from, um, because at the moment, I think we're we're a little bit in the dark as to as to what happens next. Thanks for that, Neil. Professor, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think, no, no, you know, uh, Neil's Neil's captured it really. Um, the cabinet secretary came to an event organised by Human Rights Consortium Scotland the week after the bill, and I think colleagues were appreciative of of the cabinet secretary. Um, Honouring that that commitment, albeit to tell us that the, the to offer the reasons as to why the commitment to the bill had not been been honoured, um, but I think there's the the commitment has been articulated to bringing forward a bill in the next parliamentary session. I'm not sure how a sitting government can commit a future government to legislation. But what we maybe can do collectively is work with government and with parliament on what needs to be done to get this bill finally over the line in a shape that can start to deliver um, the, the access to justice that colleagues have, have eloquently outlined. And I think perhaps there is again a role for committee here in as well as, as our different um, organisational rules around the table um, in terms of 
regular updates from government, from Cabinet Secretary to committee as to what's actually happening, um, perhaps engaging um, as rules and regulations apply with, um, in conversation with the Secretary of State for Scotland on what engagement there is with the UK government um, on smoothing um, those relations and, and any legal or other uh, constitutional obstacles um, so that there is greater preparedness as well for the introduction of a bill in 2026. Um, and I think those um, actions by committee and across parliament would certainly help maintain momentum. Um, because momentum, I think there's a lot to be asked of civil society organisations who, who you know, were kind of led up the hill and a huge amount of, of um, resource expended. And so maintaining that momentum um, needs to have other voices, I think, amplifying um, the, the need for a uh, a robust human rights framework in, in Scotland, but also contributing to that, the development of that human rights culture, that narrative um, that is about the ways of thinking and doing in Scotland. Thank you. Lucy? Yeah, if that's okay. I, I think my point might lead nicely into yours, Emma. Um, but we, have, we are deeply disappointed, as I've said, about this. And the, our messaging has been that this is a deep breach of trust between the Scottish Government and ourselves. But not only is this a breach of trust there, it's a breach of trust between us as an organisation and our members, because we have facilitated countless hours of workshops with people who have faced true and horrific human rights violations, re-traumatising themselves by retelling that story to us, with a promise that we would see incorporation of their economic, social and cultural rights within the framework and time given to us. Um, it's also deeply disappointing that this seems to be a decision that the government were aware of for a few months before springing it on us on programme for government day alongside other legislation cuts. That is frankly not on. Um, we should have been told about this before that when it, <laughs> it was sunk within the news. Um, and it also, as Neil said, took us by shock. So communicating back to those members who have, again, traumatised themselves and telling us their stories is deeply hard for us and puts a breach of trust between us and our members at a time when third sector funding and the Human Rights Consortium is totally independent of any public sector funding is scarce. So, um, yeah, it's, it's deeply disappointing. Thank you. Emma? Yeah, I mean, I just sort of add, add to that. I think um, I was reflecting, um, having participated in the advisory board for the bill for a number of uh, well, number of years. Um, I mean, this decision really came out of the blue for us. Um, literally the, the day before um, it was made, we were still expecting to see um, the recommitment to the bill in the programme for government. Um, we ourselves at Just Right Scotland and a number of other organisations I know did this as well had, had written privately to the First Minister over the summer just seeking reassurances about the um, government's continued commitment to human rights and to this bill and um, although the response that we got was somewhat vague um, it still was in, in the same vein of committing to um, continuing to take forward the incorporation of human rights um, and I think, I mean, certainly it was an unexpected decision. I, I would go as far as to say many of us really felt quite blindsided um, by what happened. And um, Lucy's talked about the breach of trust that has um, been felt by many across the uh, third sector, across civil society. Um, and that is that is really deeply felt, I think, um, when we gathered um, a week later at uh, the first uh, annual Scottish Human Rights Conference, um, that sense of real betrayal actually was really palpable in the room and the, the anger I think across the sector was, was also palpable and that is because of the um, time and commitment and effort and energy that so many people have put into this process over so many years and I think as, as Lucy has said for, for organisations like my own and others who have, have asked our clients, have asked our beneficiaries, have asked the people who use our services to to come with us on this journey, to, to turn up to events, to share their own experiences, to share their trauma, to um, give their time, to give their effort, to trying to uh, develop uh, proposals. We've, we've asked them to invest some faith in us in that process, and, and we have now been left in a position where we're essentially being asked to communicate the government's um, decision 
back to them without really understanding and or being convinced as we spoke earlier about the reasons for that decision and that's a very very difficult position for us to be placed in as organizations and i think when we're looking ahead to you know where do we go from here um it is absolutely the case that scotland's civil society remains i think really uh, committed to to this agenda that was also very palpable when we, we gathered a few weeks ago um but I think the onus now really sits with with government to re rebuild and repair the, the trust or the, the, the breach of trust that has taken place here. And I think collectively we are also now really recognising that when it comes to leadership of Scotland's human rights journey, when it comes to leadership of this agenda, um, we, we really need to see that as a shared endeavour between civil society, parliament, um, other sectors and government and perhaps not rely so much on the leadership coming from um, from the cabinet on this. Thank you. John, do you want to come in before? Um, um, not really much to add. I mean, you've heard um, articulated extremely well the disappointment and frustration, particularly of organisations in civic society who have marshalled lots of work and individuals in the process. Obviously, it's a matter ultimately for government to decide its priorities. Um, but we hope that um, that there isn't too much delay in moving forward, I'd say. Thank you. Uh, obviously, I appreciate the strength of feeling here as well, and we'll take that back through the committee. But thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, we have a supplementary from Megan Gallagher, please. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, I'm just interested in the conversation uh, and the exchange between uh, Marie and, and yourselves, of course, in relation to reasons why the bill hasn't progressed, the reason, uh, the feelings, and I sympathise with those feelings amongst uh, the sector in relation to the, the bill being halted for now. Um, do you think there's an element of that the Scottish Government's perhaps bitten off more than what they could chew with the bill? Because I was looking at the uh, consultation responses with interest to find out you know, the, the range and breadth and depth of the, the types of areas that people wanted to see incorporated into the bill. You've mentioned some of those as morning in relation to housing, right to food, but of course there's other elements as well in relation to women's rights, women single sex spaces that of course were incorporated through those uh, responses as well. So I'm wondering, do you think that there is an element of the, the bill being too large in scope and perhaps the Scottish Government not knowing how to hone in on those particular areas to formulate and bring together legislation that would perhaps work for every single sector that was wanting uh, their rights incorporated into it. I don't know who wants to start with that. I know there's a lot in there, but I don't know if there's any, anyone that wants to start with that. I'm happy to just say a few words, and I'm sure others will, will have things to add. Um, uh, so I think in the, the government's rationale, it, it says something like... Um, uh, something about stakeholders have expressed concerns that proposals don't go far enough and as you say um, particular concerns around the proposals as we understood them last summer in relation to for example disabled people's rights, women's rights, the rights of those experiencing racism. We are one of those stakeholders who in our consultation response um, said we're concerned that these proposals as they stand or as we understand them don't go far enough we think more can be done here are views and suggestions and ideas on, on where um, things could go further. Now, our understanding is that is the purpose of a consultation process and uh, we would have expected as a result of that, that consultation process to which hundreds of organisations responded that the government would have been able to then present um, its proposals uh, in the form of a draft bill that we could then um, all look at and scrutinise further and that this parliament could look at and scrutinise further. That is, as we understand it, what a legislative process is designed to do. So I, I think that, um, I don't think that um, this bill represents, you know, biting off more than the government can chew. I think it's a complex, it was always going to be a complex piece of legislation, um, but there is a, a vast uh, wealth of expertise in Scotland and beyond Scotland that can help with that process. And unfortunately, without a draft bill in front of us, we're all a little bit stymied in how much we can now engage in that. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I don't think incorporating human rights should be more than any government, biting off any more than any government can chew. It should be the core business of mm -hmm. government. And it is baked into the structure of this Parliament and and of the, of the its creating you know its creational act. 
I think after 25 years of devolution, we should be experiencing a more mature governance and more mature government um, and governance at all levels. And that includes having a more confident um, and engaged relationship at all levels of government, um, including the UK government, whatever the political parties. Um, now, there have been impediments to that, but on all sides. But it shouldn't be about sides. It should be about how to work to what I believe to be a, you know, a devolution dividend. It has been possible to do things differently in the devolved administrations. And so extending um, rights in, in Scotland is within the domain of the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government. It's not a threat elsewhere, but could be um, leverage elsewhere. And so reviewing the constitutional arrangements should be part of a mature relationship where all parties, and uh, political and uh, entities, enter into that with uh, a mature and, and positive um, aspect and, and priority. I also think the other dividend from this lengthy process, and, and colleagues that are joining behind us have been involved in this for many, many years, but through the engagement that colleagues today on this panel have been discussing, the huge policy innovation that, there has, that this process has produced mm -hmm is something I would really encourage colleagues all round the table and across the Parliament to not lose sight of. The discussions that there have been on healthy environment and the real, really innovative and distinctive positions that colleagues have taken on that. Questions around housing, questions around um, children's rights and the, th that we already have secured in corporation. And so how do we um, extend that? None of these should be viewed as impediments but as levers and as tools to develop. Thank you. Yes. I think as well, um, I, I agree with everything that has been said. This was a promise. Mm -hmm. um, so regardless of whether it was more the, uh, than they could chew, which I, I don't think it was, this was a promise that was made. And the Scottish Government have failed here at providing the people of Scotland with information about their human rights and why this is so important um, because this should be more up the agenda than it is and they could and we could be using accountability functions such as this committee um, and and other levers like international monitoring to better human rights here and we have had scant engagement from the Scottish government on UN reviews as well which has been disappointing when we are a country seeking to incorporate so many rights so I would um, trust that that gets better in the future and, and hopefully this committee can hold the government to more account on implementing those recommendations. A second thing is our national human rights institution needs more power and that is something that the Scottish Government are able to do through our current Human Rights Act. Um, at the moment the Scottish Human Rights Commission is one of, if not the least powerful NHRI within the UK and we should be pushing that agenda forward as well. We have so many levers we can pull upon and so many things to make human rights better within this country. Out with this bill, this bill is hugely important to creating that framework as stated in my first answer, but we should have transparent and viable steps forward in the next year communicated to us on, on how we're going to work to make human rights um, more widespread as well so that it is a priority. Thank you. Yeah, I would support the comments that have been made and, and absolutely support um, Lucy's comments around additional powers for, for SHRC as well. I guess just to come to your question, um, I don't think it's that the Scottish Government bit off more they can chew. I mean, the bill, um, the proposals are significant as they as they should be because they are potentially transformative mm -hmm. and they are, as touched upon, complex um, as a result. But as has been mentioned, a lot of work has been put into this and it's been a real journey. So, you know, in 2018, the First Minister's Advisory Group on Human Rights Leadership um, Published, published its report. In 2021, the National Task Force for Human Rights Leadership um, recommended the bill. Consultation took place last year, almost 400 responses. Um, there's been advisory group and executive board, lived experience boards, implementation groups. And so, you know, in terms of, you know, has they bit enough more they can chew? We've been chewing it for quite a while now. And, um, you know, none of the challenges that are presented are new. And that takes me back to, to, to an original point or an earlier point around it being about prioritisation, about mm -hmm. political prioritisation. Um, all of the challenges 
issues and, and uh, complexities are navigable, as I'm sure your second panel will touch on. Um, and so, you know, it's not too difficult, it's not too complex, it can be done. It's a simple case of prioritisation, and I think that's important to be clear on that. Thank you. I'm not sure, John, if you're wanting to come in at this point or... I'm not sure if anything to add to what mm -hmm. colleagues have said, really. Thank you. Um, convener, if you may indulge me in just one short... Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Um, and should the Scottish Government bring a bill back in future, given the consultation period started quite a significant time ago, just as referenced by Neil there, do you think that it would be appropriate to therefore have to go back and reconsult if that would be what would have to be done? Because obviously we've had a pandemic, we've had other big, huge issues that have faced the country since then. Do you think that would be a distinct possibility that perhaps all those um, consultations that have happened, all of those uh, insights that have taken place would therefore have to be redone because it would be so much of a, you know, a, a difference when this process started to where we are just now? I don't know who wants to take that. I know it's very hypothetical. Well, I mean, I think we would encourage the committee to be um, looking for um, you know, sight of some kind of draft bill in the remainder of this, this session. The consultation, the formal consultation of the bill was post-pandemic, um, and the, the evidence generated across um, both the formal consultation and through all the other processes that colleagues have touched upon has brought forward many, many issues um, that could be resolved in the formulation of, of a, a future draft bill. Um, so there's plenty of, of evidence there and plenty of, of material there to, to know what need and we've touched on it today, whether that's in access to justice and being clear about the remedies, the clarity for duty bearers on implementation, the reporting cycle um, and reporting formats that have been uh, need to be to be clarified, minimum core obligations, as I've said. And so a number of, of those technical implementation issues have already been surfaced. And so what then we would urge both Parliament and Government to do is to make use of this so-called pre-implementation period um, to address those um, matters in, in practice and to resource the implement to support the resourcing uh, sorry resourcing to support implementation um, across the the sector but in terms of building that capacity and competence within public authorities as well um, so will there require to be a, a, a sec a, an additional consultation that's about transparency and accountability and engagement. So, yes, absolutely. But I would hope that a future bill that would be consulted on would have taken on board um, the many suggested changes and recommendations that have come forward through a very rich engagement process. And I would very much hope as well to see um, the Parliament very much more engaged in the scrutiny and, and the, um, the dis uh, discursively in, in um, a future human rights bill. Thank you. Just very briefly, because I know we're running out of time, um, we wouldn't appreciate a second consultation based on the one from last year. What we do want is concrete proposals. Mm -hmm. And we know parts of this bill have been drafted already. So um, if we were able to consult on those, yes, that would be appropriate. And as Angela has referred to as well, the minimum core obligations as well, we would be happy to, to consult on that sort of work, but not a 44 question um, consultation like last year, because we wouldn't have anything new to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Convener. Okay, thank you. We'll now move on to questions from Annie Wells, please. Um, Convener, I don't have any questions this morning. Thank okay. you. Everything that I've had has been answered. It's been very comprehensive. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, well, that's bringing us to a close of this uh, evidence session, but I just want to give this opportunity to ask if there's anything that you feel that you haven't got across that you would like to say before we wind up. No, nope, you all seem content. That's great. We will suspend uh, briefly for a change of the witnesses. Thank you.
Thank you. Welcome back. We will now take evidence from our second panel today, and I welcome to the meeting Professor Katie Boyle, Chair of Human Rights Law and Social Justice, University of Strathclyde, Nicole Busby, Professor of Human Rights, Equality and Justice, University of Glasgow, Professor Aileen McCarg, Pro Professor of Public Law and Human Rights, Durham University, Alan Miller, Professor of Practice in Human Rights Law, University of Strathclyde. Professor Miller is also the former co-chair of the National Task Force for Human Rights Leadership. And Dr Andrew Tickell, Senior Lecturer in Law, Glasgow Caledonian University, who is joining us remotely today. So thank you all for joining us. Um, as with our first panel, we are really pressed for time today and we've, we have a lot to get in. So we're just going to move straight on to the questions. And the first question is, is from myself. And I really want to ask you, what's been your involvement in the development of the Human Rights Bill? And I wonder, can I come to um, Andrew first, please? Hi there, great to be with you again. Really, I have had very little involvement in the development of this bill. My interest particularly has stirred in this topic around what it means for human rights and cooperation in Scotland in the wake of the UNCRC judgment by the UK Supreme Court. So that's really where I come in on the devolved constraints here and how they shape what the Scottish Government, what the Scottish Parliament can and cannot now do in the field of incorporating fundamental rights. Thank you. Um, Katie Boyle, please. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, so I was a member of the First Minister's Advisory Group for Human Rights Leadership, um, where I advised on models of incorporation and my research expertise, expertise which covers legalisation of economic, social and cultural rights. And I was then subsequently a member of the advisory, academic advisory panel to the National Task Force. Thank you. Uh, Nicole, please. Thanks, convener. Thanks for the invitation to speak today. Um, so I, like Katie, was a member of the First Minister's Advisory Group uh, for Human Rights Leadership. I chaired the academic advisory panel, which advised the National uh, Task Force. I am a current member of the Scottish Government's Implementation Group for the Bill. Um, I'm also a member of the Civil Society's Incorporation Working Group and academic lead on uh, a number of projects, a, a, a series of projects in partnership with the Human Rights Consortium Scotland on the impact of the proposed bill on civil society. Um, and my particular interest is in uh, domestic equality law and its interaction with the international human rights framework. Thank you. Aileen, please. Thanks, and thanks for, for the invitation from me as well. Um, my involvement in the, in the bill has been uh, towards the, the later stages. I think I did give evidence to the First Minister's advisory group on one occasion, um, but it's, it's mainly been more recent. Um, I, along with Nicole, I'm on the Scottish Government Implement Implementation Group and have had a number of um, briefings from uh, the Bill team um, over the past couple of years. I've also done uh, some uh, published uh, briefings which have been published for uh, the Scottish Human Rights Commission and from, for the Human Rights Cons Consortium Scotland, uh, specifically on the uh, legislative competence issues that, they, that, that the bill raises. Thank you. Alan, please. Yeah, thanks very much, Convener, and, and congratulations to you and the committee for having this session. I really welcome it, and, and thanks for the invitation. Um, it seems my involvement has been about half my life in, in preparing for the bill, and, and that's not too much of an exaggeration. Um, but I suppose to be a bit more serious, um, I was elected by the Parliament in 2007 as the inaugural chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, and it gave a call at the outset for incorporation of our international human rights treaty obligations. And then I left office 2016, and maybe a lesson in there for me, more progress seemed to be made after I left office to get us to where we are today. Um, the then First Minister, after the Brexit referendum, asked me to chair an advisory group to advise on Scotland's human rights journey post-Brexit. Um, and that led to my then being appointed as the independent co-chair uh, with Shirley Ann Somerville as the, the other co-chair of the National Task Force for Human Rights Leadership, um, which made 30 recommendations on the bill, um, which were accepted. And we then went forward with preparation of the bill, the consultation process. And, and here we are today. Thank you very much. 
Um, we'll now move on to questions from Maggie Chapman, please. Thanks very much, Karen, and good morning to the panel. Thank you, thank you for joining us uh, this morning. Um, much like some of the conversations we had with the earlier panel of, of stakeholders and, and talking about the difference that human rights legislation can make to communities and to individuals, I'm interested in, in your views uh, around what you think the difference of, of this bill or, or, or a bill in this space, human rights incorporation in, into Scots law, what difference it would make to people's lives? And I suppose part of that question is, where do you see within the current landscape of policy, design, legislation, all of that, um, the gaps or, or, or the failures of, of, of the system, the landscape to, to um, deal with uh, issues that people have around uh, realising their, their rights. I don't know. Alan, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, what, what yeah, no, a, a great opening question. Thanks, Maggie. And, and um, a very concrete example of the impact that the bill could still make. Um, for the last two and a half years, um, having been appointed by Nicola Sturgeon as First Minister, <laughs> I've been helping build and lead um, a process to establish a charter of rights mm -hmm. for people affected by substance use. Um, uh, so I've been chairing the National Collaborative and working with people affected by substance use, the length and breadth of the country, and those duty bearers, the decision makers, as to how services are designed, delivered and, and monitored um, on substance use. So we're launching after a lot of uh, engagement with people the length and breadth of the country, raising their hopes. Um, we're launching a charter of rights this December. Um, and it will include uh, the rights that exist under our present law, but also the rights that were anticipated under the Human Rights Bill, particularly the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. So as a result of the bill not coming to Parliament before the, the election, it means that this charter of rights, which would have been underpinned by that mm. bill, will be standing alone without the accountability framework uh, that it would have had. And therefore, the implementation of the right to health will be left voluntarily to those designing, delivering and monitoring substance support services, but that will not be accountable. Um, so the Charter will still be extremely a uh, big step forward, uh, sort of changing the stigma and the, the power imbalance, but it will not achieve its full potential until such time as, as the right to health is brought into law. So not only improve lives, save lives um, is, uh, is where we are in the, the field of um, the drug deaths and the impact the bill needs to have um, in that context. Thanks, Alan. If I can unpick that a little bit and, and, and maybe broaden it out, actually, when, when you're talking about, you know, Without the accountability, people wouldn't have that uh, legal right to health. I mean, that seems like a pretty stark statement. For, for us, you know, in the 21st century, a, a country that says it takes the human rights of its citizens and, and all, all who live here seriously, how, where, where are the, the gaps at the moment in, in the legislative landscape or, or the policy landscape? Is it, is it around accountability? Is it around implementation? Is it around design? How, how have we got things so wrong for, for people who, 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 who the, the, your, the charter you've spoken of will, is designed to help, but, but also other people, disabled people, uh, people of colour, um, di different groups that haven't had their rights realised? Yeah, I think um, some groups in our society have been left more um, invisible than others uh, and their specific needs and their specific rights have not been uh, given the priority um, in the same way that they, they need to do and, and that mm -hmm. we assume they have been done. So in the context of you know, a big public health emergency of drug deaths, we, we are shifting from a criminalisation process um, uh, which, you know, criminal justice, prisons, courts, which has failed. And we have been moving belatedly, but nevertheless very welcome to a public health approach. Mm -hmm. But the experience has been of those people affected by substance use that the public health approach can still be full of clinical, medical models, not seeing persons as they are, the trauma they've been through, the wraparound support they need from housing, from income, in order to engage effectively with services that see them for who they are and what their needs are. So even within the, 
the public health model, there's a, a further step that needs to be taken, and mm -hmm. that is the right to the highest attainable standard of health and addressing the power imbalance between the person coming off the street and the professional who you know, has good intentions but thinks they know better than the person mm -hmm. whose life it is that decisions are being made about, and the self-stigma that comes from feeling you don't have a right. Um, others have rights, we don't, and, and therefore you don't, you don't seek and demand what, what you're entitled to um, the same as everyone else. That's what the right to health would, mm -hmm. would do, and to, not just legally but culturally, and, and empower people um, to um, you know, assess what they need and, and, uh, and what, what they should get from services. Mm -hmm. Th thanks, Alan. That, that culture point was raised a few times earlier as well. It's, it's clearly very important. Eileen, I can go Thank you. I mean, I'm perhaps a bit more agnostic on the on the benefit of these kinds of rights in instruments than than some of the other people you might have heard from or be hearing from. Um, but what I think the value of broad frameworks of rights adds to you know, your existing ability to legislate to improve people's rights, you can do that. You can do that through individual pieces of legislation, uh, individual policy initiatives. But what something like, like this does, and it's, it's a bill modelled on the Human Rights Act, so we can draw some, some lessons from what the Human Rights Act does, is uh, broaden and decentralise the mechanisms for protection of rights. So you have uh, the possibility of legal challenge working in tandem with mechanisms to raise the profile of rights issues in the political process. And these things, you know, sometimes the legal, the legal process doesn't give you a remedy, but it might raise the political profile of an issue which then, then leads to, to political change. Mm -hmm. So I think the evidence in, in relation to the Human Rights Act is that, that the, the impacts have not been um, huge, but they haven't been unimportant. And they've been important particularly in the sort of gap-filling way that you're talking about, mm -hmm. in, in allowing people to raise issues that have somehow been missed in, in, in other processes. Now, in order... F so, so two, two caveats with that comparison with the Human Rights Act. One, we're talking about different kinds of rights here, mm -hmm. and we don't yet know mm -hmm. how the courts will um, interpret uh, the, the, the rights in, in the, the, the treaties that are proposed to be incorporated here. Um, they might find them more difficult to, to enforce uh, judicially than, than convention rights. We don't know that. The other difference, though, um, relates to the scope of the bill, and this is where issues around about um, devolved competence become important. In order for a, a piece of framework legislation like this to do its job effectively, it has to be as wide in its scope as possible. And that's where the... Uh, the competence issues that, that, that arose in relation to the UNCRC bill and arise here as well uh, are, are, are potentially very, very serious because they're narrowing the scope of, of this bill and therefore mm -hmm. narrowing its ability to perform that uh, kind of backstop function. OK, Th thanks, Eileen. That's, that's really helpful. Um, Nicole. Yes, thank you. Um, I think the difference the bill would make um, in the context in which I work most uh, commonly is, is in public service provision. Um, I think there's a lot that the bill could do and should do in terms of integrating human rights and equality, particularly in terms of duties, um, so duties imposed on public service providers. Um, we live in, Scot in a Scotland where I think the Joseph Rowntree Foundation's latest estimate was that over a million people live in poverty, uh, in deep poverty, intergenerational poverty, uh, which is racialised, gendered, um, lots of the policies um, and, and legislation also designed to help with that are ableist, and so they exclude disabled people from their scope. Um, and so we need something, we need some form of mechanism, uh, something which improves or leads to some improvement mm -hmm. uh, and, and prioritises human rights and equality, uh, deep, you know, real equality, um, in terms of the public service uh, provision um, and the sort of mainstreaming of, of e human rights and equality um, in that. So although um, I think Aileen's absolutely right to outline the difficulties legislatively that we might see in terms of the rights framework itself. I think in terms of the duties, the kind of, I don't want to call them softer duties because I think they are really important 
Um, the bill gave us an opportunity to catalyse actually the equality duties, the current equality duties, the public sector equality duty, the Fairer Scotland duty, which aren't working very well. We have real difficulty in measuring or showing any impact um, of those particular uh, duties in terms of public service provision, although providers tell us that they're doing lots of work and we've no reason to disbelieve them. Mm -hmm. They're doing lots of equality impact assessments, but we're not sure really what impact those assessments are, are, are providing or leading to in terms of change. So the current equality framework isn't working well uh, in Scotland for a, a variety of reasons. It takes a very narrow approach. Um, the human rights framework has the ability, even in terms of those duties, to open the space up um, to impart a different approach, a more substantive approach to equality, in contrast with the formal equality approach that we currently have. Um, and I think it would provide a very good framework, a very good starting point or basis for looking at improvements to public service provision um, in that way. Th thanks very much for, for that, Nicole. I, I wonder, if, can I just um, ask you to elaborate a little bit more, because you talked, you talked about the the, the failures of the current equalities mechanisms, not those duties, not actually not actually working because they're too narrow. But there's also something you, you said about the, the challenge of, of mainstreaming and or, or how how we understand that. And we heard from Angela Hagen this morning about some of the the failures of mainstreaming um, in in the the. the the, the, the broad rights and, and equalities um, landscape, I, I think, as well. How is it that legislation like this could have actually allowed us to either take a view that was not different to mainstream, but, but would actually enable enable that embedding of that, that sort of found... found I was going to use, use, use the word foundationing. I don't know. Sorry, that's a terrible word. Um, but, but actually make us take human rights and equality seriously from the, from the first point, rather than seeing it as an add-on, as something fluffy and extra down the line. Yes, so mainstreaming itself, I think the theory of mainstreaming is good, but the practice of mainstreaming hasn't been so good. Right, okay. um, that's part of the responsibility lies there um, because of the way in which the, or the failure there lies, because of the way in which equality is dealt with under the current framework. So it's a single axis framework. We look at, you know, um, one right to equality based on one protected characteristic or one particular mm -hmm. ground uh, at a time. Um, and we, we are more or less reliant um, on party party civil litigation, so private cases being brought by individuals. Uh, we heard already from the earlier panel about the difficulties in access to justice, for example, mm -hmm. um, and the advice and representation deserts, actually, that, 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 uh, that exist across Scotland in respect of different uh, rights holders. So um, there's a real difficulty there. Um, of course, the intention should be, I think, of any legislation like this, should actually be to keep um, these issues away from the courts and tribunals. Mm. They should only come in as a last resort, which is why I put the emphasis on public service provision and mainstreaming there. The human rights framework gives us much more opportunity to look at an intersectional approach to equality, actually, so that we're not looking at those single issue, single axis approaches, mm -hmm. which we currently have under the Equality Act uh, approach. Um, and it kind of opens up the space, as I say, to a more substantive equality. The treaties themselves are based on a much more holistic approach to equality, to the achievement of equality, and looking at outcomes rather than inputs, rather than processes. Mm -hmm. We look at actually what are we seeking to achieve here and are we achieving that? How can we measure that? Um, and I think that would give much more opportunity for uh, legislation, not just a, a human rights bill in and of itself, but other legislation to be subject to a, a proper sort of mainstreaming approach in terms of, uh, of development. Thank, thanks, Nicole. That, that, that's really helpful. Katie, if I can come to you. Thank you very much. In terms of the benefits of incorporation, I think one of the important things to note from the outset is that we are discussing incorporation of international obligations. These are international obligations that the UK as a state party has signed up to. 
So ultimately, what has been attempted through an incorporating bill is to close the accountability gap for the UK's state obligations in relation to devolved areas. Now, that has become slightly more complex because of the UNCRC reference judgment, and we can mm -hmm. discuss that in some greater detail. But I think it would also be helpful to ensure important emp empirical evidence that helps us understand the importance of incorporation. So no model of incorporation is a panacea, and nothing will transform overnight and solve all the problems that we encounter in relation to social injustice um, and, and sort of one fell swoop. You will always have struggles to achieve social justice. What a human rights bill does is embed accountability in decision making, which takes a normative approach. So it, it has standards which are higher than, say, for example, we say everyone should have um, social security but not apply a substantive standard to that, then what you can see is the invisibilisation of injustice. So it makes injustice visible by assuring that decisions are held to standards that map onto a human rights framework, which addresses the fact that, and you'll see this in your own work um, in terms of your constituencies, people will face clustered issues relating to health, housing, education, employment, debt, poverty. They will be interrelated and they will often be systemic in nature, so they won't just apply to one person, but will apply to multiple people at the same time. So applying a normative human rights framework to, to those scenarios helps us overcome hurdles about improving people's everyday lives mm -hmm. in a holistic and accountable way. And the empirical evidence in this is is you know very much within Scotland and we have already looked at much of this of, of the, the what, why and how of incorporation. It's been a process and it's been deliberative for 10 years. There's been much embedded in terms of lived experience. The All Our Rights report that was conducted as part of the National Task Force um, uh, process explained all of the things that people with lived experience of these clusters and systemic issues tell us that they need more accountability, that they want to be able to rely on law to claim their rights and hold power to account. Um, we can also see, for example, if you look at it from different perspectives, uh, epidemiologists at Glasgow University have explained that there's been ex it estimates in excess of 350,000 deaths as a result of austerity. We can see that through the Marmot Review, which looks at the social determinants of health, that people are uh, living, um, they are, they're dying earlier and their health outcomes are worse. And, and this is compounded in those areas where there's socioeconomic deprivation. So the reasons for addressing this holistically, empirically, are there. Um, but also, I've done a UK-wide research with practitioners that range from people who advise um, um, rights holders in, in food banks, all the way up to lawyers who advise them, to um, barristers and advocates in, um, in the highest courts in the UK. And they, practitioners themselves, say we need an accountability framework that we can use when we're addressing these issues, because at the moment we're trying to shoehorn arguments into the rubric of something else. Instead of looking at housing through the right to adequate housing, they're having to look at it through Article 8 of the ECHR, which isn't fully comprehensive. So bringing the UK's international obligations, ideally across the whole state would be preferable, but the Scottish Parliament has an opportunity to close the gap in so far as it's possible within devolved competence. And finally, empirically, we also know that decision makers would be empowered by a framework that helps them make decisions mm -hmm. which comply with human rights. Mm -hmm. Often decision makers will be faced with what's called street level bureaucracy, where they're feeling the managerial sort of positions of cost efficiency um, and, and trying to deliver services in very difficult circumstances. Having normative standards, which is about dignity and human rights compliance, can also empower people at the front line of decision making. So empirically, a holistic framework helps to address some of those issues that we know the evidence is there to suggest we need to do more. Th thanks very much, Katie. Andrew, if I can come to you. Yeah, I mean, so to return to your opening question, which is what difference does it make? I think my answer would be it depends, right? It depends what bill we're talking about. We don't have a draft bill in front of us. We can't really talk specifically about the accountability mechanisms that may or may not be in the bill. That was, I know, a major topic of the last um, consultation. So it all really depends. I mean, these themes are all out there in terms of what embedding human rights in law could mean in practice. But again, it depends. It depends on 
mainstreaming in practice? Do decision makers, whether at that street level, bureaucracy level or at the allocation resources level, really think and use human rights deliberatively? You, know, you as a parliament, for example, have the foundation of the European Convention on Human Rights, which says that you should take into account those civil and political rights in deciding whether legislation you're looking at is within or outside competence. No, we know that politicians often will find themselves treating these issues not as broad themes or values which need to be explored and battled with, but often as a kind of legal tick box exercise about is this within the law or outside of it. You know, the human right principles, as you all know, are not rules. They are broad principles, and in the context of, um, of social and economic rights, with a view towards progressive realisation, recognising that different states and societies have a different level of economic activity and different ability to realise rights to health and, and what have you. So it all really um, depends on what happens in practice. And that's why I think those open inverted commas, technical issues of the scope of the bill are not technical issues because they are about what rights can you argue about, what rights can you use the accountability mechanisms for if it does come to court. And that is where the UNCRC judgment, which I'm sure we'll expand on in due course, as I said to you last time I was at this committee, has made a huge difference. And I do think the debate around this cannot simply treat the devolved issues as if they're technical issues, which don't go to the fundamental question of what can any bill achieve? Because in my view, those technical issues are fundamentally about the kind of justice which can be achieved by a human rights bill. Thanks, Andrew. I'll, I'll leave it there, Karen. Thank you. We'll now move on to questions from Paul Kane, please. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And perhaps quite neatly, we are going to move on to the government's reasons uh, for not introducing the bill. Um, so I suppose I'm keen to understand from the panel, first of all, if they have found the reasons that were given convincing, or, or do they indeed think there were other reasons uh, at play? And, and we had some discussion in the previous panel uh, about speculation around budgetary concerns, for example. But I think in this panel in particular, I think that... Um, the view of the, the Supreme Court's UNCRC judgment. Um, it would be useful to, to, I think, cover that if we can. So I, I'll perhaps um, start. I, I don't know if Alan Miller wants to come in and then we'll take others. Yeah, um, thanks. So do I find the government's reasons for not bringing the bill to Parliament now convincing? Uh, no. Um, I don't underestimate the challenges <coughs> that the government has faced, and, and there are multiple of them in recent times. Um, and I don't underestimate um, the points about the implications of the UNCRC judgment from, from the Supreme Court. Uh, not just what it determined in its judgment re limiting the scope of the UNCRC bill and, and therefore the Human Rights Bill, but just the uns certainty it has created that no one can really say with confidence what is devolutionary, what is reserved, where, where, where are the parameters here so that, you know, we have a number of lawyers and academics, you've got another five and I'm sure, and they, they would all have their interpretations. For, for the ordinary person on the street who, who's got the right to know what my rights, uh, what, what duties do these people have towards me um, so that I know how to hold them to account. It's completely unsatisfactory where we've been left in the sort of limbo land and not knowing where Westminster's sovereignty ends and devolutionary competence begins. So I don't underestimate all that. Um, and there is a need for the Scottish government to try and see if the, the new UK government um, can be more engaged in trying to find some shared understanding and putting that into law so that all of us don't have to be a professor or whatever to try and make sense of it. Um, so I welcome that. And it should be possible um, because you're dealing with an international legal framework that the UK has signed up to uh, and, and is obliged to give effect to it one way or another within the UK and therefore the devolved uh, governments have the same uh, obligation. So it's not as if we're, we've got competing priorities or interests or drivers, it is the same framework, it's just a question of giving them, giving them effect. Uh, and I would therefore welcome anything that comes out of that. But the, the big question about the reasons not bringing the bill forward is that 
none of that reasoning about trying to get an agreement with the UK to have a shared understanding about the sovereignty of Westminster need not and should not lead to the conclusion, well, we can't introduce the bill to Parliament this side of the election. And that's the crunch. I, I was talking to 15 members of the change team in this national club who aren't lawyers or academics or whatever, but they're, they're people who have been through the mill in life and have got real life experience. And they said, tell us, Alan, what, what is this all about? Why can't the bill come this side of the election? Uh, and so I you know, went through all of this and, and they said, right, right, right. And then they just reduced it to, the, to the, the simple issue. So we have to wait for the outcome of the next election as to whether we get our rights. And I said, yeah, that is it. That is it. Because the negotiations with the UK government need to go on, should go on, hopefully will yield something. Time will tell. Um, but that's not a reason for not introducing the bill this side of the election. The task force was very clear. This government, this parliament has a responsibility to get this over the line. Then the duties <clears throat> under the bill, it would, it would take three to five years before the procedural duties, the substantive duties come into effect. A long, long timeline for anything that comes out of the Scottish Government UK discussions um, to then come to, to you in Parliament uh, and strengthen uh, the bill in the same way as they could strengthen the UNCRC uh, Act. Um, so. It, it, it now means that unnecessarily the discussions between the two respective governments, welcome as they are, um, need not and should not have led to the bill not being introduced this side of the election. Because we don't know where we are on the other side of the election, what the landscape will be uh, and whether the incoming government uh, will be committed to introduce the bill uh, or, or not. Professor McCarrick. So again, I think my view is probably a bit a bit different. I mean, what I said earlier is that for a, a bill of this nature to work, it needs to be as broad as possible in its scope. It also needs to be as simple as it possibly can be. Again, we take the, the analogy with the Human Rights Act. The Human Rights Act is a beautifully simple bill. Its application, of course, is complicated in any individual case, but the bill itself is simple and easy to understand. And, and the starting point for the UNCRC bill was modelled on, on the Human Rights Act. Equally, it, it went beyond it in some respects, but equally simple, elegant, comprehensive. What we ended up with in relation to the UNCRC Act was anything but simple and comprehensive and very, very narrow in scope. And this bill, because the issues that affected the UNCRC bill are only one of the competence issues that have to be grappled with here. This bill is at severe risk of ending up excessively complicated. And if it's excessively complicated, its impact is going to be very much undermined. The, the, the time and resources that should be spent arguing about what people's rights require will be spent arguing about whether or not there's any obligation to do anything at all. Okay, and I think that that's bad. So my view would be if a delay means that you can get a better bill at the end of the day, that is that's worth having. Because there are potential things you could do to try to fix some of these problems, but none of them are as good as we are as, as the original model. None of them are as good as the original. They're all partial. They're all complex. Many of them carry uh, competence, risk, competence risks of their own. And I keep banging on about this, but the, the competence risks don't just come from the UK government. Some of them do. Okay, the UK government has particular powers to stymie uh, the the enactment of any bill. But challenges can come down the road from anybody else, from anybody else who's got an interest. And that might be a public authority who says, well, actually, we don't really have the money to, you know, to meet this claim that you're, you're making of us. So, you know, so we'll, we'll argue for a narrow interpretation of the bill, which means we don't even have to engage in uh, you know, the substantive discussion about whether or not we've breached your rights. So there is a real risk of this legislation being bogged down forever in competence difficulties. And so I would say if if the 
issues can be dealt with at source, and I think the US, UNCRC uh, uh, bill competence issues can, in principle, be dealt with at source. The equalities issues, uh, which are also quite difficult, uh, yeah, those are difficult and those are more difficult to deal with. But if we can deal with the UNCRC issues at source, you will get a much better bill at the end of the day. Would anyone else like to comment on that at this stage? Um, your question, your question was about whether we were convinced by the the rationale given for, for not bringing the bill forward, and, and I'm not convinced. I, I, I mean, I, I take Aileen's points um, absolutely and, and agree with them, but I do think that having gone this far down the road, you heard from the panel earlier. I sat in on that evidence. Um, civil society invested have invested a lot um, of time, resource, and energy in this process at the invitation of the Scottish Government. They are, they've upskilled hugely. So we have a really well-informed, dynamic civil society sector, um, ready to engage, ready to, to participate. And they have done that um, over many years now. Um, so I think there's a huge risk um, in, in losing that, losing, losing the, the trust and confidence of, of that um, sector, um, which I think um, should be borne in mind. Not I'm not convinced by the, the reasons given by the Cabinet Secretary, um, because I, well, one of them is that the UNCRC case makes it, in the way that Alien has, has outlined, makes it very difficult for um, a, a cohesive, coherent piece of legislation to now come forward without taking uh, further steps to kind of look at what the risks there are and, and, and try and respond, try and fix some of those. Um, but the other um, concern was that um, the proposed uh, approach to incorporation didn't go far enough in protecting disabled people, women, women and those who experience racism. That clearly came out of the consultation exercise that was conducted by the, the government in 2023. And we saw a lot of disappointment in that exercise in the, in the responses to that consultation about the perceived weakness of approach. We don't have a bill, we didn't have a bill, we haven't seen a draft bill, but we have seen what the proposals were at that stage. And I would say that there's still a lot there that could have been put into legislation at this formative stage by way of a framework, a beginning point. Um, and, I, and again, I come back to the duties um, that I spoke about earlier, the positive duties approach. And that was what was outlined in the consultation uh, exercise in relation to what we now call the Equality Treaty, so the CERD, CEDAW and CRPD. Um, and I think it would have been a really good starting point, a really good underpinning for the Equalities Act or the Equality Act that we currently have. Um, and the only other point I'll make is that there's incoherence here because the Scottish Government say in its programme for government, priority number one is that it wants to eliminate child poverty. I think it's going to really struggle to do that without better um, and clearer uh, enforceable rights. Um, and the Human Rights Bill would have taken us one step further to achieving that. Um, we've heard it's a process, not an event, so it would have been one step um, but it would certainly have given priority, I think, to the achievement of the eradication of poverty. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, there is no legal impediment to bringing forward legislation. The decision to delay is a political one. Um, having said that, the complexity around the issues relating to devolution are difficult hurdles to overcome. They are not insurmountable. So there is a decision to be made about delay or press ahead whilst those devolved issues are resolved, rather than take a view about whether or not the decision was correct or incorrect. What I'm really keen on is understanding what are the barriers and what are the paths forward? So where are the solutions? In relation to the bill itself, you could introduce a bill much like the UNCRC Act and accept the fact that its scope will be limited, but that you can build on that over time. Um, so you could introduce a bill while the UK and Scottish governments are trying to come to an agreement on um, it, it clarifying the scope of devolution. Um, if you delay, my concern is with this bill that the election period is um, a hurdle which is very difficult to overcome because no one can predict 
um, who the next administration will be and who will have responsibility for this area. It may well indeed be the same administration, but different portfolios could change. You could have a different form of cabinet. You could lose a lot of the knowledge that's been built up. People can change roles. Um, so, so my concern about the, the election is that ultimately, if a, de if a delay does occur and you do not introduce within this session, you need some form of custodianship, which takes it from before the election to after the election. We've had several periods of uh, participatory processes which have set up um, national task force, a uh, first minister's advisory group, lived experience boards, involvement from the National Human Rights Institution. So a form of independent custodianship between uh, the election periods would be extremely helpful to make sure that nothing is lost on that. And also you could have a committee bill under Rule 9 of the standing orders. It's an option to take forward a bill and for the parliament itself to um, delivered as a guarantor of human rights. Um, we haven't seen what the bill says, but in relation to the scoping issues, which are unwelcome and complex, there is no doubt that is, there is a watershed moment uh, when the UNCRC reference came out and the differences it made to the UNCRC Act. And I think it's really important to understand what, what that barrier is. Ultimately, the scope of the bill will be restricted to acts of the Scottish Parliament and powers conferred on decision makers under acts of the Scottish Parliament. Prior to the UNCRC reference, it was thought that you could incorporate rights in relation to devolved areas and what a decision maker would need to do is ask, is this a devolved area or is this a reserved area? If it was devolved, um, incorporation legislation would apply, whereas now a decision maker needs to look at the source of the function. If the source of the function or power is held in a UK Act of Parliament, even if that's in a devolved area, it's beyond scope. And this is really problematic because throughout our period of devolution, Acts of the Scottish Parliament have exercised devolved competence by amending Acts of the UK Parliament in devolved areas. So the Housing Act um, 1987 contains amendments that the Scottish Parliament has passed throughout its, its, its devolved um, history, but that would be beyond competence because the 1987 Act is an Act of the UK Parliament. So this is what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. Is it hosted in an Act of the UK Parliament or is it hosted in an Act of the Scottish Parliament? Even if it's a devolved area and it's in, and it's in an Act of the UK Parliament, it means the bill doesn't apply. But coming back again to the, the what I started with, that this is about um, state obligations. These are already UK state obligations and decision makers should already be working on the basis that they should be seeking to comply with UK st state obligations unless a piece of UK Westminster legislation prohibits them from doing so. So there are ways to try and move past that difficulty with the scoping issue. Nonetheless, in the same way that it applies to the UNCRC Act, in order to move past that, there's three options. The first is that over time you codify, uh, repeal and reenact all those acts um, in relation to Children Act, the Homelessness Act, um, all uh, the areas covered by UK acts of, uh, acts of the UK Parliament, and pull them over into acts of the Scottish Parliament so that the, so that the bill bites, so it's brought within scope. That's going to be really time intensive and resource intensive. The second option, and Aileen's written an excellent paper on this, so I would defer to her on the options, but around primary legislation to clarify Section 287 of the Scotland Act to make clear that um, you, acts of the Scottish Parliament um, are, uh, or the bill can apply to acts of the Scottish Parliament even if they amend UK acts of the Scottish Parliament in devolved areas or through a Section 30 order. I just want to bring your attention to two other processes that we might learn from. One is the Bill of Rights process in Northern Ireland that had a 10-year participatory process which ended with recommendations in 2008 to have a, a new uh, act for um, rights in Northern Ireland. And after that 10 year process, it was given to the UK government, which was a Labour government at the time. And the Northern Ireland office said, we don't see these uh, rights as being particular to Northern Ireland. And we see difficulties about incorporation of economic, social and cultural rights. Um, that wouldn't apply a UK-wide basis. So as soon as you open the door to bringing this discussion to the UK government, in a good way, it will open up the discussion of asking the UK uh, as a state to, to, to close its accountability gap, but ultimately it won't be a quick process. And second, when we had everyone in agreement on a Section 30 order, which was to clarify uh, the Scottish Parliament's power, 
to have a referendum bill in Scotland. It took 30 months in order to reach the legislation which enabled the Scottish Parliament to have um, the, uh, the Referendum Act um, to hold the, 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 the referendum here. So none of these timelines are short, and I would agree with what Alan said at the start, that ultimately you can have two processes concurrently, but that will take immense political stewardship to do that in order to try and clarify these issues on a pan-UK basis, because it's not just Scottish um, devolution that's at issue, it's also Northern Ireland and Wales, whilst at the same time trying to do as much as you possibly can to close the gap on accountability in relation to those areas where the Scottish Parliament can. Thank you. Um, if I can, I'm just very conscious of time. Yeah. So I'm going to bring Dr. <laughs> Andrew's Dr. indicated yeah, Dr. Like Kell, and, and, and a keen, I suppose, to, to get from Dr. Kell about his view of um, the possibility of solving the problems that have been created or not? Yeah, I mean, Katie just outlined a range of the particular challenges. I mean, Alien has described them as arbitrary, that the only bill you can pass will be an arbitrary one about who can take it to court, who can challenge the issue, which rights fall within the bill or not. So there are way forwards, but they're not generally within the gift of the Scottish Parliament. That is the first and simple thing to say. You know, the source of all of these problems is the UNCRC uh, judgment, and Katie just outlined its main force. You now, let's go back to the basics. The reason why the Supreme Court held that the UNCRC bill exceeded competence was the interpretation of Section 28.7 of the Scotland Act, which says effectively that Westminster retains the right to legislate for Scotland. Now, most people thought, many, many of the MPs, I suspect, who passed it, even the Westminster government when they sponsored it, thought that was simply a declaration of what we all know, that Westminster is sovereign under the constitutional system. But in the hands of Lord Reid and the Supreme Court, that was reinterpreted in a much more expansive way to say that the Scottish Parliament cannot condition that legislative power by the Westminster Parliament. You can't subject bills, acts passed by Westminster, even in devolved areas, to the kinds of rights in the UNCRC bill or indeed in the bill uh, which we're discussing right now. That is a fundamental problem. That approach to devolution by the Reid Court is, in my view, completely incoherent and impractical. I think it's one of the worst devolution judgments which have ever been handed down. And if we want devolution to work better within the United Kingdom, there's a very powerful argument that reversing that decision by the court, and there are different ways to do it, would be one way of fixing this problem in a really straightforward way, which means we don't have to get into the weeds and difficulties of this act falls within competence and that act doesn't, and the bafflement and confusion. This is guaranteed to generate for rights holders and for duty bearers. So the Westminster government should be engaged with, in my view, by the Scottish Government and indeed others, including the Parliament and other interested uh, parts of the sector here, to try and point out that we can fix this problem quite straightforwardly. From 1998, the Scotland Act recognised that although foreign affairs are a reserved matter, giving effect to international agreements were within devolved competence. You know, the Scotland Act, as originally framed uh, over 25 years ago now, recognised that this Parliament might wish to incorporate new rights into law. And it's that judgment by the Supreme Court knocking on its head expectations of most academic public lawyers in the UK about how devolution would work, which has generated this problem. And there's no reason why we should simply stick with it, but it would require uh, an amendment either to the primary legislation uh, set out in the Scotland Act, which would require Westminster to legislate. Aileen also has a cunning plan which she set out in her in her, uh, in her own evidence about a more straightforward way this might be done by amending Schedule 4 using a Section 30 order. But she's much better placed than I am to give you the detail of, of that cunning plan. But I think either which way you do it, there are practical solutions, but it will require engagement with the Scottish Government and with the UK Government to get it done. I would say, if you remember the discussions we had at the, re the return to Stage 3 about the UNCRC bill, what that was about was about deciding who has responsibility in terms of public authorities, which laws are they subject to, and in terms of the right to challenge legislation, which acts of the Scottish Parliament fall within scope. If you introduced this bill right now, you'd have to have all of that detail in there from stage one. You can't avoid doing that. So I do think the idea that the Scottish government should have proceeded with a bill thinking that it might need to be radically amended down the line, depending on a political conversation which hasn't happened yet, does not feel terrifically realistic to me. Okay, 
I think that was very comprehensive. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> comprehensive. Um, um, thank you all uh, so much for, for your um, questions um, and, and answers there. But can I please ask, we are running very um, tight on time now, if answers could please be as succinct as possible. But of course, you know, they need to be well-rounded as well, so not cutting, cutting off anything that you really have to say. But if we could keep it succinct, because we still have another three members possibly to ask questions and a few minutes left. Um, Marie McNair, please. Uh, thank you, convener. I'll be very brief. <laughs> um, just wanted to ask you how the um, the non introduction of the bill was communicated to you. No, there we go. That's really brief. So, pop it out to you. In my case, I uh, read the program of government. The program for government. That was that was it. Um, I think because I'm a member of the implementation group, I did get a letter from the Cabinet Secretary, which was the letter actually that came to this committee. I was in the same circumstances as a member of the implementation group. I received a letter. Okay, thanks. That's me. Was that you? Oh, that was really succinct. Thank you so much. Um, we now move on to questions from Annie Wells, please. Um, I think just following on from, from Marie's question, I mean, obviously receiving the letter, but I mean, how, I mean, I know we, we were disappointed when we heard that it wasn't coming ahead. So what was your sort of initial thoughts on, on this when you received the letter? Because I know we got the letter, it was the same. So, and obviously for yourself, um, just to read in the programme for government, the communication, how was that for you? <laughs> yeah, could have been better. I mean, we, the implementation group had two meetings that were cancelled, um, so I, I suppose we kind of began to have a feeling mm. that things maybe were not as straightforward as they had seemed to be. Um, so it wasn't a huge surprise, um, but I, yeah, disappointed I think is the mm -hmm. word because it, the lack of attention paid to it in the programme for government, in, even in the absence of a bill, there is mention of the human rights uh, legislation, um, which is good. Uh, in the programme for government, but no real elaboration on that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, disappointing. Yeah. I think I would just add to that that um, it's important in relation to our roles professionally to be able to separate, you know, a, a personal reaction yeah. to a broader reaction. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was able to, to do that, I think an important point to note is that every stage of this process has been incredibly participative. Mm -hmm. It's about being genuinely informed, inclusive, deliberative, including people with lived experience who give up their time yeah. when facing these types of issues. Um, and they had been empowered through that process mm -hmm. and to have no consultation or notification about delay is is a, essentially disempowering. So rather than call it disappointment, I would call it disempowering. Mm -hmm. I think for me it was, it was not personal because it's, it's not about um, me, it's about the impact on, on everyday lives of mm -hmm. people and the, the frustration that is experienced out there as a result of, of what was communicated and you know less concerned with how it was communicated although clearly that is an issue um, but the frustration i think felt is that you know whilst yes there are all these complex challenging constitutional and legal issues which can't be understated um, you know i've been on this journey along with many others for since the human rights act and before and what you see is when you do go on this journey and there's a moment to make a big step forward, maybe not as big as you would like it mm. to be because of all these reasons, but a big step forward, you want to secure that base camp yeah. on, on the journey up the mountain. And then once you've secured that base camp, you go on to the next mm. step towards the summit, which you never reach, but you're, you're <laughs> always going there. And this was an opportunity to sort of secure a big step forward yeah. uh, because one of the outcomes of like the Human Rights Act, which has a lot of deficiencies about it too, it's only civil political rights, not the everyday bread and butter economic mm -hmm. social rights. But with the Human Rights Act and with what this bill would achieve, you give rise to all kinds of innovative policy development and, and creative policy making and development of good practice, which is sort of in a sense below the radar mm -hmm. of all the, the legal constitutional discussion that, that will take place up here, important as that is. But in everyday life, it frees a lot of duty bearers and rights holders to engage in a much different way than they had been able to before and come up with um, things that actually improve people's lives. 
Um, so securing that base camp would have been a stimulus mm. for all of that, and, and that's the frustration that um, is felt, I think. Mm. I'm, I'm happy with that. I don't know if anyone else has anything to say, but I'm happy with that. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Really short question. No, you're, you're absolutely <laughs> fine. We, we do have a, an extra few minutes, so that, that's fine. We're not going to rush you and cut you, and cut you off. So, Megan Gallagher, please. That's great. Well, good afternoon, panel. And it's a really quick question from me, but given we are roughly, say, 18 months away from an election, and we were about to perhaps embark on stage one of the bill, should the government have put that within their programme for government, do you think that would have been sufficient time to actually get a bill of this breadth and scope through the Parliament, or do you think it was the case that there might have been an element of the Scottish Government running out of time to embark on something that's so widespread? And I don't know who wants to perhaps start. Well, I mean, I'll, if, if no one else is coming in, I'll come in. I mean, I'm not a, a, a parliamentary procedure expert, but the, the advice that we had been given up until the time the decision was made not to put it in the PFG was that there was sufficient time um, in the legislative timetable to get the bill through. Um, and therefore, that, that was never presented as a as an obstacle, there are enough obstacles in the road <laughs> that were presented, but that wasn't one of them. And so there was no, um, no sort of concerns widely felt that the time between now and, and the end of the parliamentary session w w was too short. It had been left later than many of us had wanted it to be, mm. but you know, we understood some of the reasons for that. But um, yeah, it was never aired as a, as a big issue that we're actually running out of time here. And, uh, and I don't think that underpinned the reasoning at all of of the government. Okay. Andrew, please. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think, you know, thus far we've highlighted in terms of those particular technical challenges, which which uh, which we've discussed, we focus primarily on the UNCRC implication. I think that's right to do that because it's probably the most fixable of the problems which we have in front of us with the right goodwill between the different parts of the British uh, state, if it's there. Uh, Aileen mentioned something earlier, which I do think is worth highlighting in this context about timelines, which is that that is not the only competence challenge with this legislation, that the other, which is still substantial and which I think has been less scrutinised in general in public thus far, is that issue of equal opportunities being a reserve matter. And therefore, that poses very particular and different challenges for those parts of the incorporation agenda, which focuses on those rights around disability, around race around the rights of women, which are also in play here. And you can't pass a bill until you've resolved those fundamental issues. So if the Scottish Government had brought forward a bill, I think we can say with the degree of confidence what strategy they'd adopt in terms of the mainstream social and economic rights. They would replicate the approach that we saw taken to the UNCRC bill as inadequate and problematic as it is. We do also have to take account, though, of that second strain around equal opportunities and what precisely that reservation means this Parliament cannot to do in the field of equal opportunities. That is also an area of significant ambiguity. And if we are trying to track a constructive route forward through this, that also, I think, needs to be explored and clarified and may also require, if change is going to be put on a sure footing, further action by the Westminster government to clarify the devolved settlement, to make clear what this parliament can and cannot do in terms of those rights that are rooted around issues of equality. No, thank you very much. Thank you. If I may, just to, to wrap up the question, and um, I, I would like to ask what your suggestions are for a way forward. And we, we've heard from a few people, I mean, uh, there's a wealth of organisations have said that they would like the Scottish Government to commit to introducing the bill in February 2025. Emma Hutton suggested the human rights movement might lead work on the bill. And also yourself, um, Katie, suggested a working group to be custodians of the work to date to ensure continuity after the election. So if I just, if I go around everyone and, and hear from your suggestions, that would be great. If I can start with you, Andrew, please. 
Yeah, well, I think, you know, in the first panel, you heard that nothing's really changed around these legal issues uh, in recent times to prevent the Scottish government progressing with this bill. I think that's politically not true. We do have a new Westminster government which has been elected, which as part of its agenda has made clear that on Sewell motions to other things, that devolution and how it's working, as well as intergovernmental relations more generally, is something the new incoming Westminster government is concerned about. And I think, you know, you can pass off this issue to civil society, you can make the Scottish Human Rights Commission custodians of it, but it doesn't deal with the fundamental problems, which are not really about the merits or demerits of bringing human rights into devolved law. It's about devolution and its limits and its constraints. So the best way to do this simply, as Aileen said, the best way to get the best bill at the end of it is to try and explore the approaches to fixing those devolution problems created by the UNCRC judgment and created by the ambiguity around equal opportunities in Schedule 5 of the Scotland Act. So I think the only people who can do that really are the Westminster government. Uh, the only people who can make those changes are UK ministers. And for me, that would be the first place to start because that's our last best hope of incorporating these rights meaningfully into Scots law in a way which achieves the goals that we outlined at the beginning, which are maximalist and expansive, but which are also simple and clear so that rights bearers and duty holders know what they can and cannot do and know the legal consequences and risks of not mainstreaming it into their practice or not uh, reflecting these rights in their decision making. That I think is the best route towards the best kind of human rights bill which is possible and it relies primarily on politics driving, uh, driving legal change. Thank you. Alan please. Uh, momentum, vision, renewing both um, through the government taking its responsibility to put in place a, a collaborative problem-solving process like the task force process was um, in order to ensure that at the earliest opportunity a bill is able to be presented uh, to the parliament that has done what it can within the current circumstances to be as uh, maximalist as it can be um, but recognises the need to legislate where we are under the current constraints uh, with a view over a longer period of time to, to strengthen the bill and strengthen the, the human rights framework. So I think um, we should do everything that we can over the next 18 months uh, if the government you know, doesn't reverse its decision, which doesn't look to be likely. Um, that the momentum is not lost and we're, and we're not having sitting on our hands waiting for something to come out of the, mm. the Westminster Holyrood uh, discussions um, and that people are not disempowered and continue mm. to be as engaged and problem solving and taking responsibility to have a bill in as good a shape as is possible as early as possible in the new parliament and that, that would include meaning that all the political parties look at their manifesto commitments um, and uh, certainly the, the present government uh, should have in its uh, manifesto commitment uh, a very clear intent to introduce a bill at the earliest opportunity. And, and also to say that, you know, I, I work a lot with the UN in different parts mm -hmm. of the world and, you know, we have to recognise that getting to this stage, Scotland is setting an example in sort of affirming the international human rights system. Uh, the world, to a certain extent, is looking at what progress Scotland is making. And credit should be given that the Scottish Government has taken us to this stage. It's then stalled, um, but we're going into, into extra time um, and we should still be working collaboratively um, to get this bill over the line for our own purposes as well as the international um, message that it would give. And I see Maggie Chapman nodding and I know that the Greens uh, and we're encouraging the government to go ahead with the bill. And I think if, if the parliament and the committee as a whole did something similar, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Aileen, please. So not surprisingly, I agree, agree with Andrew that the important thing is to, to resolve, as far as can be done, the, the problems, the competence problems at source. And I say that because actually it's not just a matter of this bill. The UNCRC judgment puts the competence of this parliament into a, a, a state of serious doubt across across the board and that needs to be resolved as he said that is uh, that's dependent on the agreement of the uk government and the imperative therefore is to persuade the uk government that that change is required to tell them why this matters to you and also i think 
to, and this is something which, which confuses me, uh, to make them realise it doesn't really matter to them. I mean, it, it doesn't really matter to the UK government what you do in devolved areas, really. It, it, they've been kind of standing on a point of principle which doesn't really seem to me to be a point of principle anyway because it, it, it's a misinterpretation of what Section 28.7 was about. But this is a political process. Mm -hmm. You as a parliament, if you care about this bill, if you care about your competence generally, you need to be, to be bringing that pressure to bear on UK government ministers. And you know, the, there, are, uh, there are ways of doing this. Primary legislation is a possibility, but not necessary. A Section 30 order can be done, and, and there is no need for that to take 30 months, as, as, as Katie said. I mean, once the Edinburgh Agreement was, was, was in place, it was only a, a, a few months before the, the Section 30 order in that case was passed. And Section 30 orders are passed quite frequently and don't take that sort of length of time. So we could fix this quickly if agreement can be reached to do so. Thank you. Nicole, please. Thank you. Yeah, given we are where we are, I, I agree with that approach. Um, but I will come back to where I started from, which is um, thinking about um, what can be done, I suppose, in the absence of why we are waiting for a bill to come forward. Um, in the programme for government, um, priority four is to uh, ensure high quality and sustainable public services. And um, there is some detail there about a framework to embed equality and human rights across the Scottish Government and wider public services, with mention of an action plan, a toolkit, and linking that to the public sector equality duty. I think this is really important preparatory work that needs to be done anyway, regardless of a bill. We should be doing that. We should be looking at the frameworks that we have for the duties around equality, um, including the Fairest Scotland duty, and linking those to human rights duties for all um, duty bearers in Scotland. Um, and that would really clear the way uh, in terms of preparation, I think. We talked about culture, or I heard the earlier panel talk about culture and a change, the necessary change in culture within public services. This certainly would be a way of setting the groundwork there. Um, we know from the public sector equality duty um, consultation that took place a couple of years ago now, that there is a real appetite among public authorities themselves, and again the civil society sector, uh, to support changes to the PSED uh, approach. And I think that we could be working on that in the meantime, and that would really be a very valuable piece of work that we can all be getting sort of stuck into while we wait for um, the, the legislative uh, approach um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, working with the, the, the UK government in the, in the way that Aileen and Andrew have, have outlined. Thanks. Thank you. Katie, please. Thank you. I uh, think that we do need clarification on the scope of devolution and uh, clarity uh, from the UK government on um, the legacy of the UNCRC reference. However, I would say that I don't see that process as requiring to be completed before um, we press ahead with embedding rights in terms of them already being able to apply to those pieces of legislation which are within scope. So the bill should be treated as a stepping stone. It should be passed um, expediently. And at the same time, there should be uh, work done on clarifying the scope. Preferably, um, what we need at this point is a clear plan, milestones, deliverables, what is the actual path that's been taken forward? If it's a Section 30 order, that can help address Section 28.7 issues and the equal opportunities reservations. But if that is the process that's being followed, it would be helpful to know so that we can start to engage around mm -hmm. that. So clarity on the path forward, uh, when we might hope to see um, objectives reached, as well as working towards in incorporation without delay. And if it is required, to wait until after the next election, some form of custodianship so that we do not lose mm -hmm. all the work that's been done to date. That's great. Thank you all for your participation this morning. It's very much appreciated. That brings to a close our session in public and we will now go into private to discuss the remaining items on our agenda. Thank you.